This is Audible. The Detective, a Galactic Football League novella. Written by Matt Wallace and Scott Sigler. Read by Scott Sigler. Introduction The Detective is a Galactic Football League novel, which is part of the Siglerverse timeline. In the timeline, this novella takes place from roughly March 2683 to March 2684. Where applicable, the chapters are named to match the action in The All-Pro, which is book three in the Galactic Football League series. The detective actually begins, however, on unknown dates during book two, The Starter. In terms of the GFL timeline, the detective runs from roughly week 7 of the 2683 regular season in The Starter through week 10 of the 2684 regular season in The All-Pro. You can enjoy the detective on its own or as part of the overall Galactic Football League series. Book 1. The Minds of Makovi. Chapter 1. Caleb. Caleb Cole had come to realize there was music in the minds of Makovi, if you had the right ears with which to hear it. Music made with a melody of emotion, often dark, often hopeless, punctuated by the percussion of sharp steel points colliding with stone over and over again, hundreds of thousands of times a day. McCovey music was not the syncopated song of a well-rehearsed band. You would find no easy meter, no constant rhythm, no metallic chorus of pickaxes falling in perfect time with one another. The sound of each tool was as individual as the man who held it, and if a unified beat ever spontaneously arose, that beat vanished in reverb generated by the endless catacombs. Tens of thousands of pickaxes chewed at the rock, the ancient accretion of that planet destroyed by the steady swing of men, just as a colony of termites slowly erode the tallest of trees. Among those countless swings, the loudest concussions came from the young and the strong, each of their blows landing like the wrath of some vengeful god. The young ones hated the minds the most. The young ones always seemed to be waiting, waiting for someone to scream for rebellion so they could bury the chipped ends of their picks into the foreman's skull. The young ones, you see, had not yet been fully beaten down. They had that great curse of life on Makovi, the curse of believing that they were special, that they could change things, that someday they could escape. The older miners didn't swing with as much vengeance. They relied on wisdom, on experience, carefully choosing the target of each swing for maximum effect with minimum effort. Their axes fell in the slow, slouching toward Bethlehem rhythm of the beaten down and the broken. Though their bodies were still strong for the most part, they had come to accept that either their short lives would forever be spent here and had willingly given their fighting spirit to the mines, or that the mines had slowly strangled their souls a slow death that they never saw coming until the battle was already over. Finally, and nothing but a faded note in all of that, there were pickaxes dropped so weakly they barely registered, like the clink of glasses from an insincere toast. These were the swings of the old and decrepit, those soon to give their last breath to the minds that had eaten their youth, their manhood, their lives. Caleb heard all these distinct notes. He recognized each sound for what it was and what it said about the man behind it. He couldn't help that. He couldn't turn his powers of observation off any more than he could stop breathing. Fortunately, the other dirty, sweating men didn't seem to hear the music within the noise, didn't hear the orchestra of stone and steel. If they did, they certainly didn't find any human pathos in it. He was glad of that. If they could hear the way he heard, they might get wise to the fact that Caleb Cole didn't swing his pick like the standard lifer mine worker. His swing was steady and dependable, measured, but performed with obvious power. It was the swing of a man doing a dead-on impression of a McCovey miner, wholly convincing to anyone watching him work 
but there was nothing of the wretched place in his blood. Caleb Cole knew that, probably, he would not die here. The miners took water once an hour. Hunchbacked old women and the occasional homely young maid came through the stone rows with buckets of questionable hydration. In an age when many races traveled between the stars faster than the very light from those stars, on Makovi, they were still brought tepid water in leaky buckets made of wood. As the men in Caleb's section paused in their labor to gratefully drink, he turned to the burly miner next to him and leaned tiredly on the haft of his pickaxe. From humble beginnings, eh? Caleb said to the man. The worker's face wrinkled. What do you mean? Caleb gestured to the chip stone tunnel around them. Didn't that star quarterback start out just like this, breaking rocks and mines? Caleb paused, as if trying to remember a name, then snapped his fingers in an affected triumph. Quentin Barnes, that's the guy. The miner stared at him blankly. How would I know? Huh, Caleb said. I thought everyone here was a Raiders fan. The worker shrugged as he took a water ladle from a hunchback woman with one good eye. I like the Raiders well enough, he said, then took a sip. But all I know of Barnes are the stories people tell, and most of those are lies. He's orphan scum like me. Heard he was a houseboy for some restaurant owner. Got to eat all he wanted. Those last words said with bitterness, envy. Miner seemed far more jealous of Barnes's past as a well-fed kid than his current status as a rich, intergalactic sports star. Lucky guy, Caleb said. You ever meet him? Barnes? No. Wouldn't wanna. Football's for pretty boys and that demon trash. He punctuated the statement by spitting his final mouthful of water onto the rocks at their feet. Caleb didn't press the man further. He never pressed any of them too hard on the subject. Word would start to get around that he seemed overly interested in digging into rising superstar quarterback Quentin Barnes's humble beginnings. But he did keep asking the question, floating that name to every man swinging an axe throughout the hollowed pits in which he'd been busting rocks for the last two weeks. Most didn't know Barnes. Many claimed to, but Caleb saw through their grandiose tales of drinking and womanizing, of bar fights and best friend boasts. Sometimes, however, he met a lifer who told the truth. And sometimes, he met a miner who knew more than just the legend. Chapter 2. Carney. The crowd of mine workers, perhaps a hundred total, surrounded a fifteen-foot diameter circle hastily sketched on the quarry's rock floor. Their cheers, drunken and ecstatic and lusting for blood, slid up the hundred-foot granite walls that cragged in every direction. When those cheers reached the top, where anyone with a badge or a plasma rifle, or both, might hear, the sound was no more than the babbling of running water. The workers passed round liters of a homebrew concoction they called Stinger Juice. It tasted dirty and toxic and vaguely of fermented fruit. They swilled it from bags and stained coffee tins. A few sipped from sleek composite containers of synthesized booze purchased at the company store, but those were a luxury item. Most of the boys looked down on the stuff. Inside the circle... Two of their fellow miners bashed each other with fists and feet wrapped in tough, braided strands of rope. Both men had stripped down to the same grimy work pants that everyone wore. Each man was already bloodied in several places. Bright purple patches were blossoming on their torsos. The goal here was not to knock your man down or even out. The goal was to force him outside the circle. The first man to take three tumbles over the line was the loser. When it was about being knocked out of the circle, there were fewer questions as to who won. The fights also didn't go on forever, and that reduced fatalities. It didn't eliminate them, but still, reducing them was a good thing. Caleb watched. Not with the drunken cheering of most, but rather with the analytical stare of someone who knew how to scrap 
someone who analyzed the moves and reactions of each fighter. Caleb wasn't the only one. All around the circle, up on rocks and crags in the wall, were men with that same intensity. Head tilted down slightly, eyes staring hard, bodies making the almost imperceptible motions left or right, leaning front or back, as if their bodies automatically reacted to each punch, each kick, each opportunity to slide a blow through a lazy defense. Caleb's body moved as well. Tiny twitches that would be blocks and strikes were he down in the ring. He really didn't want to take on either man, though. One was a bull-shouldered beast with skin the color of charcoal. His muscles looked like industrial cable tied into knots and covered with skin that didn't quite fit. He was an imposing son of a round bug, to say the least. His opponent, however, was an absolute giant. He dwarfed the other man. Caleb might have believed he was heavy G if not for his complete lack of caveman features. His arms also extended down to his hips, as opposed to nearly dragging on the ground like a heavy G's. The big fighter's eyes were some of the sharpest Caleb had come across. They held a predatory sharpness, certainly, but there was also calculation. The steady, scanning gaze of a strategist planning moves ahead of moves. Caleb had seen that look in the eyes of men who architected military battles and surgical strikes. The bigger fighter had a shaved head, modeled by nasty scars Caleb couldn't identify, and Caleb knew a few things about the marks left by severe trauma. This hulk of a human had a story to him. But it wasn't that man's story that had brought Caleb to the mines. He could watch fights any time. He had to get back to work. Caleb downed several fingers of the fermented miner's brew and watched the scarred man unleash a shocking quick flurry of four punches, three of which landed, leaving his opponent dazed and staggering. The giant capitalized with a leaping front kick that sent the other man flying outside the circle for the second time. He was now ahead two to zero. Caleb took another sip and passed the half-full cup in his hand to Carney, who quickly chugged the rest. Caleb elbowed him in the side lightly. Way to be a hog, young man. You sip like a girl, Carney replied, laughing. I figured it was time to show you how it's done. He met Carney's first day working the mine. Caleb had watched how the other miners worked a pickaxe and a sledgehammer, skills picked up mostly by observation and a little bit of repetition. Carney, however, had come over right away and shown Caleb how to properly hold his right hand all the way up to the hammerhead on the upswing, then slide it down to the bottom on the downswing to create maximum velocity. It was a small trick, but it made a significant difference. More importantly, Carney had done it quietly, so as not to draw attention to Caleb's rookie mistakes. A tiny bit of kindness in a place that was not kind. Caleb had taken to the kid right away. Carney was tough, and he did the job without complaint, but there was an openness about him that was unusual in this place. He had offered to show Caleb the ropes of Ringgold Incorporated's mining operation. Without knowing it, Carney had provided more useful information than Caleb had gathered from a dozen other workers. He's getting back in the circle, Carney said. He was excited. People love to watch other people fight. The bull-shouldered black man drove in. Big Bald caught him coming and twisted at the same time, using the other man's momentum against him, taking him to the edge of the circle. Such balance and speed for a man of that size. The bald one reminded Caleb of the late, great MMA champion Kyle the Heretic North. But Kyle North was gone, killed along with his quith opponent, Korak the Cutter, in the greatest fight Caleb had ever witnessed. Caleb had never thought much of mixed martial artists. He had been a soldier once, a real warrior. Warriors fought wars, not in rings for drunken fans. But the night of that title fight, watching a human and a quith warrior clash like gods, like the greatest specimens their respective species had ever produced, Caleb couldn't deny he was seeing two true warriors go at it. No, the big miner wasn't Kyle North, but he had the same qualities. Caleb might have thought him military-trained, but his style was too brutal. 
it was force over efficiency. Big Bald could have delivered another crushing blow, could have thrown elbows and knees, could have lifted his opponent, but he just pushed one more time, reaching out with his left foot to block the bull-shouldered man's heel. Bull-shouldered tried to step back, but he could not. He fell, landing outside of the ring. There were cheers and boos throughout the quarry. It all depended on whom the miner in question had bet on. Caleb leaned closer to Carney, shouted to be heard over the din of the crowd. I'm calling it a night. Carney's face wrinkled in complaint. What are you talking about? There's going to be at least three more fights. Caleb shook his head. Nah, I'm done. Before he turned to walk away, Caleb clapped his hand on Carney's shoulder in a parting gesture. Without meaning to, he let his hand linger there. It was only a microsecond, but they both took notice of it. The look on Carney's face surprised him. There was no disapproval, nothing but a guarded kind of interest in what was happening. It was over in the span of a breath, and Caleb didn't hang around to see how Carney's face might have changed when he took his hand away. He left the quarry quickly, willing his stomach to unknot with every step. Chapter 3. Frederico A mile above the jungle canopy, the Archangel is spinning out in a corkscrew of black smoke that's being stretched farther and farther downward like a spiral staircase to hell. Against the starless night, the smoke is invisible, as is the Archangel itself. Only the fires burning from its hulking dual jets can be seen from the ground. A moment later, Frederico Esteban Gisipe Gonzaga has a murderous stranglehold on the flight stick as he tries to wrestle the bird under some kind of control. His right hand is engulfed in flame, but he doesn't feel the burn, doesn't register the skin bubbling and blackening and peeling. He doesn't feel it because that part isn't real. One eye watches the burning hand that holds the flight stick, while the other spies the manic dance of his instrument gauges. The stick is locked in mechanical rigor mortis. He pulls until the sinew in his arms almost snaps, but the dying ship won't respond. It creeps closer to terminal velocity. The crew chief is screaming at him from the rear of the copter. Spittle flies from a dark depression in the older man's graying beard, but Frederico can't hear him. He can't hear anything except the warning klaxons, the hot snap of flames crackling all around, and the sound of pure, flesh-stripping G-force thundering around his bird. Frederico can't hear the words, but he doesn't need to. The crew chief is a man as hard as the steel plates beneath their feet. He can strip a copter down to its rivets, and then put it back together again blindfolded and without the hand-rolled cigarette falling from his lips. Nothing that happens on a copter can faze him. The way he's screaming can only mean one thing. They're going down, and there's nothing that anyone, including and especially Rico, can do about it. All he can do is try and pick the spot where. He aims for the trees. You should let it go, Aloha tells him, as it always does. Let this whole scene slip from your mind's eye before the crash. You need not see the rest, not again. The Loa hovers somewhere in the upper plates of the Archangel's cockpit, present but removed from this moment in time. It's just an observer, an absurd one at that. A tiny, snake-like man-thing with a long skull face, and a dusty stovepipe top hat. It doesn't belong here, and Rico knows that. A split second later, the Archangel's whirling blades slice through the jungle canopy. The copter's formerly sleek and currently burning body follows. It slams against what feels like a mile of branches and bark, each jolt enough to crush bone against any one of the interior's hundreds of steely edges. By the time it hits the ground, the shuddering impact of the trees has slowed its velocity by more than two-thirds, 
Enough to stop Rico from being smashed to paste, but not enough to stop the machine from hitting the ground so hard it looks like a grotesque tin can that's been kicked around by a schoolyard full of bullies. The crash stuns him, tries to make his restraints cut him to pieces. He coughs, not sure where he is. When the flames lick the outside of his left leg, he remembers. Unlike the hand he watched sizzle and bubble, this fire is real. He feels the heat. Reality comes back in one ugly bastard of a wave. He's alive. His leg is badly damaged, pinned under a fallen ammo crate. He's hurt, but he's alive. If he can get out of here and escape the fire, he might just stay that way. It's a good feeling, no? The Loa asks. It's sitting on his shoulder now, whispering like some devil in his ear. To survive? To brave the fire and metal and realize that you're still here? Rico ignores him. He looks around the Archangel's imploded interior. The rest of the crew, the strike team they were carrying, all dead. Even the chief. Rico feels a pang of loss when he sees the old man's body. That pang makes no sense. He barely knew the chief. He knew the chief was two months from retiring. Maybe that's what made his death just a little bit more tragic than the others. Outside the hole, somewhere beyond the fire that wants to cook his leg medium well, Rico hears a voice. He hears shuffling. It's not coming from the archangel. It's in the jungle outside. They are coming for him. They shot down his bird, and now they're coming to finish him off. You sure about that now? The Loa asks. You're hurt and scared and angry. You sure you know who's out there? But Rico knows. It's the enemy. And now they're clambering over the smoking remains of his bird and about to push through the hatch a few feet away. Rico dislodges his leg, leaving skin and bone fragments and a pint of blood under the seat. His pants leg is on fire. He slaps at it putting out the flames even as his hands hit hard against blistering flesh. It takes more strength than most men will ever know not to scream. He pulls his damaged leg, along with the rest of his body, toward the hatch. The enemy soldier on the other side is trying to jimmy it open. Rico reaches for the nearest carbine, but sees the barrel is bent. The thing is useless. He unsheaths his knife. The steel and the fabric of the scabbard create a whisper in the dark. The hatch is opening. Rico is poised to strike. Are you sure? The Loa asks again, as if it matters, as if Rico can stop time and reorder the universe to change the next few seconds. The hatch drops, and the shadow-draped form of his enemy begins to slither through it. Rico knifes him the way he was trained, Hacking and slashing, ignoring the blood and the flailing and the screams until the thing in front of him stops moving. Rico's arms go still. There's dark red juice on his hands, up and down the sleeves of his flight jacket. He's breathing like a sprinter, and if anyone could see his eyes, they'd be as crazed and as wild as anything that stalks the jungle. Get ready, son, the Loa warns him. Here it comes, again. The fire rises, and Rico sees his enemy's face. It's not a soldier. It's a scavenger. It's a woman of ninety pounds, with threads of gray hair glinting in the firelight. Just some villager who saw the crash and came to pillage the wreck. Or worse. I won't help him. So much worse. Maybe she came to help the survivors. She's dead. She looks surprised. So surprised. I told you to let it go, the Loa taunts him. But Rico can't do that. He holds on, gripping her ragged clothes in his scorched fists and sobbing hysterically. Stay here, then. The fire is rising. It'll hit the reserve tanks in just a second. You won't feel a thing, and when it's over, you'll never have to come here again. 
Rico can't do that either, because that's not how it happened. So, for the thousandth time, he tears his fists from the woman's limp body, taking wads of bloody cloth with them. He crawls from the wreckage and slithers into the darkness beyond the firelight. When the archangel explodes, it bathes the jungle in orange and red. It looks like an oil painting of exquisite beauty. Then he hears the enemy. The real enemy. They're coming, the Loa says. The knife is still clenched in Rico's fist. He'll stay low to the ground. He'll slash Achilles' tendons and pick them off one by one. They don't understand the monster that's just been made there in the flames. But they will. Moments before they all die, they will. Chapter 4 Caleb Dies There was no shrieking in the darkness. There was no bolting upright in his bed, drenched in sweat. There was no twisting anguish on his face or running from the devil racing of his heart. Caleb simply woke up. His eyelids opened in one smooth, sudden motion. He was awake and alert, and he remembered everything about the dream, the incident that gave birth to the dream, and where he was now. The Loa was gone, as he knew it would be, always knows it will be. But somehow, when the dream comes, Caleb never fails to check the dark corners and shadowy rafters of whatever room in which he finds himself. He imagined the Loa. No one is more aware than him that it's not real. But it lives in the places Caleb visits more than any other. Caleb spends more time with the Loa than with anyone else, and that makes it hard to sequester it from reality. It's about control. He created the Loa to help control the dreams, to keep himself lucid during each replay, each memory reconvened. He learned about the Loa from a squad mate, Red Bizzik. Red hid his voodoo upbringing the way Caleb hid his own desires. They sensed that extra layer in each other, sensed that there was a secret that must be hidden, and because of the desperate human need to share, magnified by a long night of drinking, they had told each other their true nature. Those truths could have gotten them killed. If anyone in the unit ever found out, word could have spread. Some were sympathetic, some didn't care, but most in the service would have persecuted them until someone stacked wood for a fire. In effect, the need to be true to at least someone meant they had entrusted their lives to one another. The act of confession had bonded Caleb and Red, a bond deeper than that of family, than that of lovers, than that of comrades. Secrets drown you. Telling someone, taking the chance that they won't tell anyone else, that is like sliding your head above the surface to take a breath to stay alive. Voodoo. Red would have burned for that, no question. Caleb had kept the secret. And for that trust, when the dreams threatened to drive Caleb to madness, Red had taught him how to conjure the Loa. It was all superstitious nonsense, but Caleb had been so desperate for a way out that he'd tried it. He still didn't believe in the supernatural, but there had to be some science to dream control because the Loa worked. The Loa became Caleb's dream guide. The ugly little man tied Caleb to the present, reminded him the dreams were nothing more than memory, memory molded by guilt and shame until it formed a nightmare. Caleb stared at the ceiling. He'd sacked out in a two-room shack that was connected to dozens upon dozens of others like it, powerful magnets making a roof lock to a floor, a floor lock to a roof, the shack stacked together like a child's set of wooden blocks. Each identical shack had a narrow walkway at the base and a ladder leading up to the face. Caleb had to climb four ladders to reach his walkway, which was so wobbly it felt like it might collapse at any moment. This is how Ringgold Incorporated, and every other mining outfit, provided housing to its workers. 
The walls were sheet metal, and the roof couldn't protect its tenants from a thimble of rain, let alone an actual downpour. Still, the company etches its logo, Twin Green Crescents, on every shack, perhaps just to give the workers a nightly reminder of who puts that roof over their heads. Caleb climbed out of his shabby cot. In the other room, which was little more than a closet, there was a makeshift grooming station. Each shack had pipes that were supposed to connect to a central pump, but enough of the pipes were broken that Ringgold just gave up and had two liters of water delivered to each shed each day. How the miners used that water was up to them. At least the plumbing worked in the communal showers. Those facilities were three ladders down, four walkways to the right. He poured half a liter of water into the sink basin, then splashed his face several times. Above the basin, someone before him had nailed a broken piece of mirror to the wall. Caleb stared at his dripping face, at his torso. He still had the scars. Dozens of them. A topographic map of his adventures and the wounds that came with them. An entire world of pain that was his and his alone. For a moment, he put away Caleb Cole and let the man who had earned all of those scars come flooding back to his mind and body. My name is Federico Esteban Casipi Gonzaga, he said to his reflection. I am a private investigator. I live in Ionath City on planet Ionath in the Quith Concordia. He repeated it. Then he repeated it again. By the third time he said it, the name and occupation started to feel real again, instead of just another shade, another mask, another subterfuge Fred used in his work. A knock that threatened to rattle the shack's tin-sheet door off its single hinge drew his gaze from the broken mirror. Fred instantly blinked away his true self, and Caleb Cole rushed in to fill the void. He moved out of the wash closet and opened the door. Carney stood there. They just stared at each other for a moment, then Carney spoke. You're not coming back to the mine tomorrow, are you? Caleb wasn't. His work here was almost done, but he hadn't sent a word to anyone, not even Carney. How'd you figure that? You didn't pick up your store tokens for the week, Carney said. If you're not planning to eat at the company store, then you must be bolting. Caleb died with those words. There was no point in keeping him alive. He'd served his purpose, and Carney had seen through him. Fred grinned a little, despite himself. You're too smart to spend the rest of your life swinging a pick, Carn. What choice I got? Always a choice. Carney shrugged. I suppose. I'm right, then? About you bolting? Fred nodded. Carney almost didn't ask, but Fred knew the question was coming. Take away the possibility of tomorrow, and most men will take their last chance on tonight. The kid smiled. Can I come in for a while? There was no real debate. Fred knew he would turn Carney away, but still, he hesitated. It would have been nice. Finally, he said, Look, man, I know why you're here. I understand, but it's not going to happen. Oh. Carney didn't look dejected, just confused. Was I wrong? I mean... You're not wrong. You just got the wrong time. When's the right time, then? If I knew, I'd tell you. But it ain't now. Carney only nodded, sadly. They didn't say goodbye, and Fred didn't wait till morning to leave the mines. He was gone less than an hour later. Chapter 5. Mr. Sam The barbecue brisket tasted better than anything Fred had eaten in the past month. He knew two things as soon as he took his first bite. The first was that he was coming back to this dive in McCovey to eat again, and the second was that he would never ask where the meat came from. Fred had seen the local wildlife, and it wasn't anything he'd choose to hunt, kill, and cook if he wasn't starving to death. 
There were cows on McCovey, but a recent bug had killed off about 80% of them. Until the local herders figured out how to stop the infection, beef was only for church elders and the super rich. Fred was just finishing when an older man with a bulging chin and a filthy apron came by his table. The man pointed to Fred's empty plate. Even most of the sauce was gone, swept up with a kind of cornbread until only abstract orange brush strokes remained on a field of porcelain white. Looks like you hated my cooking, the man said. Worst sauce I ever had. You the chef? And the owner. Call me Mr. Sam. Fred. They shook hands. Fred's curiosity got the better of him. Sam, I have to ask, do I want to know what that meat was? Sam smiled. You got the accent down cold, but you're clearly not from here. Every local knows the taste of round bug. Fred stared. You're telling me I just ate round bug? Delicious, nutritious round bug. Aren't they poisonous? Delicious, nutritious, poisonous if you don't know how to prep them, round bug. Fred nodded. I see. Well, if I die, I can promise you I won't recommend this place to my friends. The dingy restaurant was almost empty. There were only two other patrons, both of whom were busy stuffing their sauce-smeared faces and dropping bits of meat onto tan tablecloths made of coarse paper. I didn't come for the food, truth be told, Fred said. I heard that Quentin Barnes grew up here. Mr. Sam smiled. Football fan? In a manner of speaking. A lot of people come to my place because of Barnes, Sam said. But he didn't grow up here. I met him when he was 11. He lived here on and off until he was 15 and signed with the Raiders. He's a great kid, I'll tell you that. Another two patrons entered. Sam started toward them, but Fred gently held his arm. Mr. Sam, I'm working for Quentin. Could I have just a moment of your time? Sam paused, his expression hopeful and also doubtful. He, uh, send you to talk to me? Easy to read the meaning of those words. Sam missed Quentin. Afraid not, Sam said. I'm here to see if I can find his family. Sam glanced at the new customers who had seated themselves. I guess he's forgotten all about me. I mean, I only took him in and kept him alive. You'd think that'd be worth a call now and then. Uh, he's extremely busy, Fred said, the words coming out before he realized how lame they sounded. Sam sighed, then sat. I only have a minute, but I'm happy to help. You're the second person in here today asking about his family. Someone else came to talk to you? Mr. Sam nodded. Yep. You ever heard of Yolanda Davenport? Fred leaned back. Yolanda Davenport, reporter for Galaxy Sports Magazine. I have. I've seen her holocast. Mr. Sam smiled. She's even better looking in person. I could stand a roll in the hay with that one, you know? Fred smiled and nodded, an automatic, practiced reaction when another human man made a comment about a woman's looks. It was just easier to play along than to explain that Fred didn't want to roll in the hay with any woman. And in the purest nation, it was not only easier, it was also safer. Telling the truth. Here, they burned men at the stake for that. Tell me about it, Fred said. Quite a body on that girl. What did she want to know? Mr. Sam shrugged. Asked a lot of questions like, did Quentin ever bet on games? What was his relationship like with his coach? With Greedock? That kind of thing. Nothing about his family? No, nothing, Mr. Sam said. She had a different agenda. Besides, I don't know much about his family. When Quentin was little, I tried to find out about his family for him. I mean, when he was young. That boy probably came out of the womb at a hundred pounds. He's never been what anyone would call little. Anyway, I'm not a professional, but I couldn't find anything. Neither could I, Fred said. I was going to try the Central Records database next. Mr. Sam shook his head. Already tried that, I'm afraid. My friend Maxwell worked there. We searched for Quentin's name and found nothing. What about his brother, Quincy Barnes? Yep, Mr. Sam said. We looked, found nothing. That's not surprising, though. For the poor, non-church families in this place, most times there are no records at all. That was bad news. But if Mr. Sam had a contact at Central Records, that could speed things up if Fred turned up any other clues. 
You still in touch with Maxwell? Afraid not, Mr. Sam said. Purity investigation. He vanished about five years ago. Never found out what happened to him. I did what I could for the boy, but I have a business to run. Did you try the mines where he worked? That's where I've been for the last couple of weeks, Fred said. Enough people remember him, but mostly only as a football standout. He had a reputation as a brawler in the mines, though. Got into a lot of fights. Mr. Sam smiled. Oh, that. Everyone wanted a piece of the boy because he was so big. He only fought to protect himself. Used to put on a mean face at the mines, but he'd come here after. When no one was looking, he'd cry. He was only 12, 13, and grown men wanted to fight him. He did okay for himself, but he hated it and was always afraid of what might happen. Can you think of anyone else who knew him as a little kid? Maybe someone who knew his brother? Any of his family? Turnover is high in McCovey, my friend, Sam said. And I'm not talking about losing employees. I'm talking about lifespans. Being close to the wrong person can get you killed if that person gets in trouble. Pay too much attention to someone else's business? That can also get you killed. Most people find it best to stay unattached when it comes to anything outside their doors. Fred nodded. He understood. It was a little different on any purest nation planet, but McCovey didn't even qualify as a planet. It was just a colony. As long as the mines in the cornfields kept producing, the rest of the nation could give a crap what went down here. Well, who should I talk to then? It's important, and I'm running out of time on this rock. Sam's right hand cupped his face. He pulled at his cheeks as he stared off, thinking. I can't think of one place that might have detailed records on Quentin, he said. What place would that be? Mr. Sam jerked his bulbous chin toward the window. Fred looked outside. One structure dominated the view. It was the stadium, the home of the McCovey Raiders, where Quentin Barnes began his professional football career. Raiderville, Sam said, using the local nickname for the place. That's the biggest business going here. Bigger than the mines, even. Biggest legal business, that is. Now, it ain't Tier 1, mind you, but there's still a lot of money tied up in the PNFL. Stedmar Osborne owns the team. You heard of him? Fred nodded. Sure. He runs the rackets here on McCovey, right? That and more. He's a rich, powerful man, but he ain't so rich he can afford to pay someone millions and not know what he's getting for that money, so the team keeps the best records it can on prospects and active players. You can sign a kid who's a great talent, pay him in advance, but if he's related to a man who becomes an enemy of the church, that kid can just disappear. The Raiders organization probably learns everything they can about their players. Considering Quentin was the greatest quarterback that place has ever seen, if there are details on his past, that's where they'll be. Then that's where I'll go. Mr. Sam held up a finger. If you're going to get mixed up in Stedmar's business, you need to watch out for his three goons. Frankie, Sammy, and Dean are mean as a cornered stone cat. They will hurt you. They will hurt you. Not said as hyperbole, or as a warning, but as a straight-up fact. What do they look like? They always wear suits. They're big as bulldozers, all three of them. Frankie, they also call him No Neck. He and Dean are white. Tower white? No, no, the pinkish kind, like from Earthstock. And Sammy, he's as black as black gets. His right eye is steel, hard to miss. You see those three, just get the hell away, you hear me? Fred nodded. That kind of information was not to be taken lightly. Sam tapped a finger on the table. Flattery ain't getting you out of the check, son. And next time you see Quentin, can you tell him I'd love to hear from him? Fred nodded. Of course I will. An easy lie. He wasn't here to help Quentin manage his personal life. Fred paid his bill, leaving a large tip. Chapter 6. Ghoulie It was more than just a football stadium. Next to the church, Raiderville was the center of McCovey's community. 
Sometimes those two things combined, usually for major holiday ceremonies, when the local mullah would perform a sermon and the stadium would fill with those who either believed or just wanted to be seen believing. The stadium also supported concerts, religious theater, even community gatherings, when stalls and tents were erected right on the field proper. The stadium also served as the center of public executions. They had burn pits behind either end zone, because who would want to clean the ash off the 50-yard line? The pits were usually covered with a metal disc, painted in whatever bright logo the current advertiser wanted. Yes, from work to play to worship, the stadium reflected the community it served. It did all these things, sure, but on most off-season days, the place was empty. Frederico timed his visit for a day of high worship, when the believers packed into McCovey's countless churches. That not only ensured the stadium would be closed, but also that most of the staff would be attending services. That left only a skeleton crew manning the floors to which he needed access. He didn't anticipate much trouble. It wasn't much of a disguise, but he didn't need much. He came ready to hack the service entrance lock, only to find it was broken and only looked locked. Come the preseason for Tier 3, someone would discover that and fix it. For now, it seemed, it made it easier for the service staff to enter, and they hadn't bothered to tell anyone. Fred had slipped in and found the janitor's office. Some gray coveralls, a black staff hat, and a mop and bucket later, he was almost ready to go. He adopted a slouched posture, convinced himself to walk with a slight limp in the right leg, and added a scraggly beard from the kit he carried with him everywhere. Five minutes after entering the stadium, Frederico looked like a different man. A different, shorter, defeated-by-life man. Raiderville was small as far as stadiums went. It seated 14,250 officially, although when Quentin had been quarterback, they found ways to squeeze in almost a thousand people more. Everyone in a sold-out Raiderville crowd would barely fill up a single end zone of INF Stadium. So, it was easy to think of the place as small, but with no one there, the seemingly endless walkways and tunnels made it feel a bit cavernous. Fred made his way toward the stairs that led to the lower levels. Just before he turned a corner, he heard a familiar voice. A voice he had never heard in person, but had heard on dozens of sports broadcasts. He turned that corner. Yolanda Davenport, walking side by side with Ezekiel Graber, head coach of the McCovey Raiders. Her white hair blazed in the hallway's fluorescent lights. She had that solemn, you-can-talk-to-me look on her face. I've heard Barnes was a big Krakens fan, she said. Is that true? Oh, no, he wasn't, Graber said. The Krakens? Barnes loved the Pirates. It's all he ever talked about. The Toe Pirates? Yolanda said, as if it was the first time she had ever said those words. Would he have wanted to be part of that organization? Graber laughed. Yeah, no question. If he had a chance to play for them, he would take it. They passed by Fred, still talking about Barnes. Fred found his stairwell and headed down. Yolanda Davenport wasn't his business. He was here to find out about Quentin's family, and as long as she wasn't asking about that, he didn't care what she wanted. He reached the bottom floor. In a dry place like McCovey, the local backups would be kept in some basement room. Sure, the stadium was mostly empty, but if he could avoid the personnel offices which would have more cameras and more guards, all the better. It was laughably easy to find the backup's room. There was actually a working lock, but the highest tech on McCovey was at least 20 years out of date in the Quith Concordia, where Fred did most of his business. Still, he timed himself. 33 seconds to get past the lock. Not his best time. Maybe he was getting older and slower. He slid inside and shut the door behind him. Like any Purist Nation business, they kept a local backups area in addition to off-site storage. He smiled when he saw the storage devices. In Ionath City, they would have been the cheapest thing available. Thirty years ago, that was. Now, even the cheapest resale shops in Ionath City wouldn't have devices like this. Sometimes, Fred forgot just how backward the Purist Nation was. He lifted his left pants leg. He'd wrapped a sniffer routine hardware sleeve around his calf. 
He removed it and started connecting it to the interface. The program would route through the Raider system, collecting any and all references to one Quentin Barnes. Judging by the archaic computer system, it wouldn't take long. He'd just started the automated program when he heard something, something he knew he should not be hearing. A flopping, coming from inside the walls. No, no, from the ceiling. A light, irregular thumping. Something was moving in the air vents. Fred might have written it off as a rat, even a round bug, but he actually recognized the staccato beating sound. Ghoulie, what are you doing on McCovey? That sound. It was coming closer. It was coming from the air vent up near the ceiling. Fred looked around the room. He found a chair. He lifted it, then set it ever so quietly on the floor below the vent. One foot at a time, he stepped onto the chair put his hands up below the vent, and waited. Moments later, the fluttering came closer, then stopped. Still, Fred waited, hands raised above him like a spider waiting for the right moment to pounce. He heard the sound of a power screwdriver. The vent grate came away from the wall, then slid inside without a sound. Right about now. Fred timed it perfectly, grabbing hard as soon as he saw motion above him. His hands locked onto the firm body of a small hurrah. The alien immediately tried to fight, but Fred quickly adjusted his grip so that his fingertips pressed into the soft spot on its left flank, behind which lay the creature's stomach. As a kid in school, they had taught Fred how to kill every species in the galaxy. They'd also taught him how to torture them. Puncture the stomach of a hurrah, for which a straight finger punched in hard would do just fine, and the amount of pain would leave the hurrah screaming, ready to answer any question you might have. As soon as Fred's finger pressed down on that spot, the hurrah struggles instantly ceased. Rico, you want it, said Gooley, the backpack strapped to his top emitting the words. You're not a killer. You're right, Fred said. Good thing for me puncturing your stomach will only put you in the hospital for a couple of weeks. Gooley said words that came not from his backpack, but from his wide mouth. These words were more of a hiss than a tone. Fred didn't have to speak hurrah to recognize cursing. Knock it off, Gooley. What are you doing batting your way through ducks in a football stadium on this backwater rock? Fred kept his grip tight. Gooley might be small, but he was no defenseless creature. The hurrah was a well-known Grease man who worked the Concordia, the Planetary Union, and now, apparently, the Purest Nation. Gooley was a Grease man most of the time. Occasionally, though, he would take the big money and perform a hit. Fred held a tiny killer, and he knew better than to give the winged creature so much as an inch of wiggle room. Well, answer me, Gooley. I'm just seeing the sights, Gooley said. What's it to you? Fred pressed the tip of his finger in a little deeper. I'm on a job. Same as you, that's all. Same as me? Same trade or same job? How do I know? You know how it is, Rico. I just find pieces for him as a scratch. I don't put puzzles together. That's you. Don't call me Rico, Fred said. But that's what people call you. When they want a real hitter, they call for Rico, right? I don't do that work anymore, Fred said. So call me Rico one more time, and you'll have a brand new hole in your body. You got it? Yeah, I understand. So last time I ask, what are you doing here? Gooley didn't answer. Instead, he tried to wriggle away again. Fred tightened his grip and began patting him down, feeling Gooley's custom bodysuit, looking for anything that might reveal the hurrah's goal. But then again, did Fred really need to find anything? Fred was here looking for information on a certain quarterback. What were the odds that a hurrah grease man was here looking for anything but information on that same quarterback? Barnes, Fred said. You're here for info on Barnes, aren't you? Gooley struggled more fiercely than before, and that was all the answer Fred needed. Who sent you, Gooley? Anna Volani? Glory Ogawa? Greedock the Splithead? Fred heard steps outside the door. Heavy steps. It sounded like giants stomping through a playpen. 
Gooley had help. He'd triggered some kind of a call, probably embedded in his suit. That was why he'd struggled so much, even though he clearly couldn't get away. Fred yanked his wings hard enough to separate tendons. How many, Gooley, and who are they? Even though the hurrah was clearly in pain, the voice from his backpack sounded cool and clear. Answer to both questions is the same, he said. More than you can handle. Fred quickly looked around. He opened a desk drawer, stuffed Gooley inside, slammed it shut, then pinned a chair against it. There was a muffled shriek from inside and a furious flutter of wings beating against metal, but Gooley was trapped. Gooley wasn't the only one who didn't have a way out. There was only one door to the room. Fred searched, wondering if he could take the first thug through that door. If there were only two, that might even the odds. But he had no idea who was coming. They could be good church boys, or they could be human hitters from off-system. Then Fred saw his only way out. First, he reached into a pocket for a minicam and set it on the desk. That would record the men who came through the door, sending the signal to the storage cube he had in his pocket. If he got out of this in one piece, he'd have a good look at the men who were working with Gooley. Then he detached the sniffer device. Hopefully, it had found some information. That done, Fred ran at the chair he'd set against the wall, jumped, put a foot on the seat, and launched himself up. He slid his arms into the air vent, then his head, worming his body into the too tight space. Behind him, he heard the door rattling as someone tried to get in. Fred's shoes kicked at the wall, trying to push himself deeper into the vent. He couldn't make it far, but that didn't matter. What mattered was not being in that room when the goons came in. The door rattled harder. Then came that pause he knew all too well. Someone big, rearing back a meaty shoulder. Fred pushed himself all the way in. He could barely move. It was like a coffin. He moved forward a few feet, then pressed his back against the top of the vent and pushed down as hard as he could. The metal gave way almost immediately. He dropped through and landed hard on a desk. He was in another office, also vacant. Fighting back a groan, Fred rolled to his feet and limped to the door. From the other room, he heard the shuddering crack of a door giving way, and then he heard two voices. Two deep voices. No, that couldn't be. Not on McCovey. He didn't have time to stick around and find out. He quietly slipped out the door into the hall and moved quickly back toward the service entrance. In seconds, he turned the first corner and was gone long before the men rescued Gooley and came to look for him. Coverall's gone. Fred walked down the street as a man of the cloth. Blue cloth, the mark of the purest church, his robes covering him from neck to feet. He even had an infinity tattoo on his head. This time, he'd gone for blonde hair. He looked good as a blonde. As he walked, he looked at a few seconds of footage his remote camera had recorded before it was destroyed. He watched the footage and puzzled over the implications. The men who had broken into the room? They weren't men at all at least not human men. They wore enviro suits, complete with ventilation masks, like the industrial cleaning men who decontaminated the stadium facilities on a regular basis. The suits, however, were huge and bulging in a way that no human would require. And if that wasn't enough of a tip-off, holes had been cut in the masks to allow muscled pedipalps to protrude through. They were quith warriors. Fred had seen bigger but not by much. This was heavy. Alien species weren't allowed to set foot on Purist Nation soil. It happened, of course, especially in the fringes of PN space, but it took a lot of juice to grease the wheels. Gooley could get in and work because 99% of the time, no one even saw that Gooley was there. That was why he was such a good grease man. But two bruising quith warriors? They couldn't exactly hide in the ventilation shafts. Sending Gooley here was a risk all by itself. Adding in two quith warriors? That meant bribes. That meant getting at least a few people to look the other way. Someone else wanted info on Quentin Barnes. Someone with a lot of money 
a lot of power. And by now, those warriors had reported back to their Shamakath. Which meant, of course, the Nauguli and the warriors would not only be looking for info on Barnes, they would be looking for Fred. Fred had to stay on the job. That's what Quentin paid him for. But Fred knew that a dead man can't find a damn thing. He had to lie low. He couldn't afford to disappear, not with a job still to do, but there were other ways to stay out of sight. Frederico Esteban Giuseppe Gonzaga had to become invisible. Book 2. Grim Tyrant Valley. Chapter 7. Nathaniel Cornish, Sr. He was registered at the McCovey Stadium Inn as Mr. Nathaniel Cornish, Sr. Mr. Cornish was a marginally successful sales representative. For the whole of his career, he'd been employed by Magi Mining Supplies Incorporated, one of the seemingly endless and wholly indistinguishable companies that hocked industrial machinery throughout McCovey and the other purest nation mining colonies. He was a deacon at his church, a family man, polite but forgettable. It was a good cover. Fred enjoyed Nathaniel's accommodations. Considering, however, that Fred had very recently committed a major crime by breaking into the stadium less than a hundred yards from his junior suite, he felt it was time to change hotels. The laws on mining Colony 6 were barbaric by any civilized sentient standards. When you threw in the crew of dangerous-looking aliens he'd bumped up against during the job and the fact that Ghoulie could finger him, staying a few steps ahead of the game wasn't just smart. It was necessary. Returning to the hotel at all probably wasn't the most prudent move, but Fred needed to pick up his gear. He also didn't like leaving loose ends. A guest disappearing without checking out, especially one who left behind a cache of high-end spy equipment, would raise flags and questions and leave a trail to be followed. Back in his suite, Fred removed the air filtration vent behind which he'd stashed his more sensitive luggage. He believed in two things when it came to the job. Traveling light and never being under-equipped. Balancing the two edicts had taken years to perfect. From inside the vent, he removed two cases, each small enough to fit in a coat pocket without a bulge. One case contained surveillance equipment, communications tools, and data recovery devices. It was all microtechnology, some of it standard, and other pieces Fred had designed if not outright built himself. He was no hardware whiz, but he was a quick study. The other case was Fred's masquerade kit. Among the kit's contents was a compressed tube of dermal reconstructive, an organic compound that adhered to and mimicked flesh. With it, Fred could quickly and expertly create a different nose, make a more bulbous chin, or even alter his cheekbones. He could create scars or other distinguishing features, and a little went a long way. There was also a microfiber bodysuit that folded to the size of a handkerchief. Patches of it would hold rigid shapes and could be molded by electrical current. It allowed Fred to change his body type in any one of a hundred ways. Finally, a dye and cut kit for his hair, bags of extensions in case he needed a shaggier look, and digital lenses that could make his eyes any color. Fred's military history gave him numerous skills that were vital in his line of work. His best skill, however, a genuine talent for disguise, had come from an entirely different place. As a teenager, he'd participated in church theater. He played saints, apostles, even the parts of women, because women in the purest nation were not allowed to act. Fred had been a decent enough actor for the lead parts, but he'd rarely played them. With a good costume and prosthetics, he could lose himself in a bit role. Fred never liked playing the lead. He loved being a character actor. He'd had chances to move on to professional acting, but he never landed a gig. Fact was, he just wasn't good enough. He didn't have the talent to make it on the stage, but making a paying audience believe was far harder than making strangers think you were someone you were not. Audiences watched you, strangers usually didn't. It was funny how some things came full circle. Had he been a better actor, he would have made a living at it. But he wasn't good enough, which led him to the military. 
A military history led him into gun work. Gun work led him into the private investigator business. And it was there that his skill of becoming a different person found a home. Fred stowed the cases and retrieved the final items he'd hidden in the vent. His weapons. He preferred stealth on the job. He believed in avoiding conflict whenever possible. He was an investigator now, not a soldier. But his brush with Gooley and those quith warriors during the stadium penetration had changed the rules of this one in a big way. That kind of opposition wouldn't arrest him. They would murder him where he stood. And until Fred knew exactly who they were and what they wanted, he had to accept that as a possibility. And he would have to stay well-heeled for the rest of this job. He never traveled with firearms. They were too easily detected on ship or by port security. If you were caught with a gun, you talked to the Kretorakian patrols, something he'd done once, and once was more than enough to ever want to do it again. If he needed a gun, he found one on sight. Most of the time, though, he relied on more basic, more primitive methods. His special forces service gave him the best training the Purist Nation Army had to offer. They'd schooled him in the blade and the baton, in hands and chokeholds. And whatever PN training might have lacked, Fred had more than supplemented with real-world experience. His choice in weaponry on the job reflected that. They were all custom implements. There was a blade maker back on Ionath, a human of Spanish descent, a master, and one of the few craftsmen of his race from whom the quith would buy weapons. His was a family trade, and he liked to brag that his lineage went all the way back to master bladesmiths of Toledo, Earth, millennia ago. Fred had saved the Spaniard's life once. It had been completely by accident, but Fred had never revealed that secret. If it made the man happy to make Fred's personal defense tools at no charge, well, making people happy was a virtue. High One said so. And that made it true, right? The Spaniard had built a unique shoulder holster exactly to Fred's specifications. A set of match blades ran up his flanks, the handle of each close to his armpits. The blades were forged from composite materials that would pass 99% of the body scans out there. Fred could reach for either or both, and it would seem like he was simply delving into his inside jacket pockets. He pulled out the shoulder rig and slipped it on with practiced familiarity. Where the straps of the shoulder rig crisscrossed his upper back, another blade was deftly concealed, this one shorter and curved like the talon of some giant predatory bird. It was an ancient earth design known as a karambit, perfect for slashing, hooking, and dragging your opponent down. Fred wholeheartedly believed in the old human adage that preached, never bring a knife to a gunfight. He also believed in shredding his enemies before they had a chance to draw said guns. He packed his gear inside his regular travel bags, donned one of Mr. Cornish's blazers, then left the junior suite. Fred checked out of Stadium Inn. He'd also planted a ghost ticket in the database of one of the mid-range commercial transport lines that ran shuttles to and from McCovey. If anyone dug into Nathaniel's whereabouts, they would find an ordinary trail that had him staying a few days in a nice hotel, then leaving McCovey via the same shuttle line on which he'd arrived. Tracking Nathaniel Cornish Sr. from there would be a time-consuming goose chase. Fred downgraded to a prison cell-sized room at a cheap flophouse on the outskirts of the city. He ditched his Mr. Cornish Sr. persona and made up a name at random. No one here was going to ask for papers to back it up. The desk clerk, half in the bag on black market spirits, or chemicals, or both, looked right through Fred when he checked in. Once in the room, Fred finally called up the information gathered by a sniffer program. Quentin's physical information and career stats were there, of course. Fred casually glanced at these, skipping over them except for one eye-popping set of numbers. At 16 years old, Quentin had been six foot nine, 365 pounds. Mr. Sam's business must have been good to feed a kid like that. Fred filtered out everything related to football. That left very little. Quentin's work record from the mines showed dozens of disciplinary incidents for fighting. A big kid like that had been a target for people wanting to make a reputation for themselves. No pit fights. Quentin had been smarter than that, it seemed. That didn't surprise Fred. 
No one seemed to understand just how smart Quentin was, including Quentin himself. Fred focused on criminal records. Quentin's brother, Quincy, had been hanged for theft. The brother had been a couple years older. He possibly had more information if Fred could find a DNA record of the boy. And then, Fred struck pay dirt. Because of Quincy's crime, Quentin had to pay the criminal debt. This, quote, legal recourse, end quote, was designed to create wage slaves, people who owed so much they could never work it all off, but they had to work because they owed the money. The pay dirt? Fred found a reference to Quincy, all right, but it wasn't Quincy Barnes. Quentin's brother's name was Quincy Carbonaro. Well, I'll be, Fred said to himself. They gave you a new name when you were little, so little you don't even remember it. No wonder I can't find anything on your family. That changed everything. Fred had a DNA sample of Quentin taken from one of the quarterback's many bloody bandages left on the practice field. If Fred could access McCovey's Central Records database and cross-reference that DNA against the family name Carbonaro, maybe he could find something. The discovery filled Fred with satisfaction. Straight-up detective work had produced a clue. He stretched his arms above his head, yawned, felt the exhaustion of the day's efforts. Time for sleep. He sliced open the bottom of the room's sole chair. Inside his new hidey hole, he stashed his work gear and his weapons. Once he was settled, Fred found he was bone-tired and his muscles felt raw. The room had a grimy bathing stall. Fred ran the water as hot as it would get, which was scarcely a step above tepid, and stood under the faucet for a long time. It felt good, even if it did little to soothe his body. He toweled off quickly and crashed in the room's stiff cot of a bed. The mattress felt like it was trying to repel him, and the bed's single pillow was like an empty burlap sack, but it wasn't even three minutes before Fred was out. Chapter 8 The Mercenary Upstairs, the sounds of animal pleasure are a muffled, pig-grunting chorus that can't be ignored. Rico sits at the bar in the parlor of the bordello, weary of trying not to hear it, weary of being in this place, weary of the charade. He's weary of his life, the one he's made since leaving the service, since becoming an ex-commando, bumming around the least regulated rocks in the purest nation and beyond. He has sat drinking with one of the working girls long after his fellows have all disappeared with their own escorts. When they were still downstairs huddled together around him, Rico laughed and shouted and catcalled in time with their drunken chorus. He's quiet now. The girl is still talking, maybe trying to seduce him, maybe just prattling on. He stopped listening. Instead, Rico watches her, studies her body, although not in any erotic sense. She has tattoos. Some are church markings that have been blacked out or burnt with hot irons, leaving pigmented scars. Rico guesses the girl did the blacking out herself after someone else, maybe her father, took the iron to the rest. As he looks at her, feeling nothing, he notices one of the tattoos draped over her collarbone is the loa. It shouldn't be there. When he started talking to her half an hour ago, she didn't have a Loa tattoo. Yet there he is, skull-faced and perpetually tipping his stovepipe hat to all who look on. This old horror show, eh, Cher? The Loa says from the girl's wasted flesh. Its ink-stained lips seem to struggle to move her skin to form words. But Rico knows he'd hear those words loud and clear, even if the Loa had no lips at all. Rico would shrug at the creature if he had any control over this image of himself from the past, but he does not. He can only watch through eyes of the shadow that was. What's the point of coming back to this memory? You loved no one here, and no one loved you. This was just a stopover in your life, so why come back? It's true. Rico has been with the Red Moon Company for a little more than a month and he already knows his career as a professional soldier won't live out its rookie year. He despises everything about the mercenary life. He loathes the company he's kept, 
the jobs his outfit has been hired to do, and the places they have to go to do them. There's no honor in this, no real purpose, and there's no trust or fellowship. The drunken laughs and backslaps are always forced. Any one of these men he fights alongside would just as soon shoot him in the back for the right price. Red Moon has been hired by the local magistrate to clean out a jet cycle gang called Pure Steel. The Pure have been muscling in on the magistrate's illicit business, such as the bordello over which the Red Moon mercs have been given free reign. Rico spent that day doing recon on the Pure's clubhouse. The Pure number less than 50. He's confident about wiping the entire gang from the landscape with a zero body count on the mercenary side. Now that the rest of his fellow mercs, and what a sad phrase that is, that he has fellow mercs, because he takes a paycheck just like they do, he is one of them, have gone. Rico dismisses the girl. Left to his own thoughts, he hunches over the bar and makes a cigarette out of synthetic paper and black market tobacco. The tobacco is cut to the bone with high one knows what. It tastes like manure and smokes like a neck bone. Still, it occupies him. Its chemicals do their job. Rico strikes a match and lights the handmade cigarette. The first drag is like breathing in a rubber fire. It stings his lungs and pains his head. By the fourth drag, the effect dissipates. Rather than extinguish the match, Rico holds it up to the parlor lights. He is staring at the flame burning below the scorched, blackened head of the match when it happens. The force of the explosion extinguishes the flame. It also knocks Rico hard to the floor, as if he went down under the weight of the entire Ionath Kraken's defensive line. Above Rico, the ceiling has transformed into a floating carpet of fire. He curls into a tight, fetal ball as the second-floor debris rains down. Something hot and heavy hits his elbow, his hip. He feels his hair whoosh into flame. He quickly smothers it with his bare hands, losing several ounces of skin in the process. Then, his right hand is on fire, soaked in a glove of flame. The skin blackens and chars like a stake dropped onto glowing coals, but he feels no pain. This part, at least, is not real. The imaginary flame glove winks out of existence. Time passes. Rico's ears are ringing, and blood is trickling from them both. He expects the parlor to be consumed by fire, but it's not. There are flaming patches here and there, but most of it has already burned itself out, leaving only blackened, decimated remains. He'll later learn that the fire was just a side effect of the accelerant used in the explosive device. The concussive force of the blast is what did the most damage. Rico staggers to his feet. He is dazed and off balance. He can't hear. The world around him has been silenced, turning it into something like a dream. His vision makes it shimmer. On instinct, Rico draws his pistol and brings it to bear, arms extended and palms pressed firmly together around it just as he was taught to do back in the service. He heads for what's left of the staircase. The loa is perched gingerly on the banister. You don't want to come up here, boy, it warns. Ain't nothing you can do. It will only stir you up. What is here that you need to see again? And, of course, Rico cannot hear the warning. He rushes past the loa, stepping over smoldering debris, skipping the steps that were knocked out in the blast. There's more of the second floor left than he would have imagined. Many of the walls have been blown apart, but much of the framework remains intact. There is little order to what he sees. Some pieces of furniture look almost untouched, while others lie in tattered, smoking piles. Rico bolts over the charred rubble, stumbling on the unsure footing, his shoulders and arms singe anew as he bumps into charred corners and hanging bits of board. He comes upon Waycross first, half buried by the debris in the hallway. The man's legs have been torn away by the blast, one below the knee and one above it. He might live, Rico thinks. He might get bionic replacements, or even have new flesh grown to replace what he has lost. Then Rico sees the splinters, some as big and as thick as industrial nails, sticking between Waycross's fingers as they clutch his neck. Those big hands are the only things stemming the flow of arterial blood. Stemming, but not stopping. 
Waycross as fresh stumps flail, his not-their-feet trying to balance him, help him stand. His bugged-out eyes are staring at nothing, or already looking into the great beyond. There is nothing that can be done. Rico keeps moving. Next, he finds Bannon, the crew sharpshooter. Bannon seems largely undamaged, but he has as much life inside of him as a man-shaped doll. The blast hit him in a way to knock it right out of him. He looks surprised. The woman lying next to him seems much the same way, right down to the expression on her face. Finally, Rico rounds a corner and spots Danforth, the leader of Red Moon Company. Once upon a time, Danforth was a purest nation commando, just like Rico. Danforth was naked when it happened. His big body is charred black with flakes of deep red. Rico doesn't know what expression Danforth had when he died because Danforth doesn't have a face anymore. Everywhere there are bodies. Red Moon Company is no more. Rico is the only one left. Later, Rico will learn that Pure Steel knew the magistrate's hired guns were frequenting the bordello. Two Pures planted a homemade explosive in the upstairs rooms and waited for the Red Moon Mercs to retire for the evening with their chosen companions. Rico will briefly consider going after the gang, seeking vengeance, retribution for his comrades. He will realize that idea is something left over, some bit of instinct from his service days that will never fully die out. He will realize the Red Moon Mercs were not his brothers in arms, just his co-workers. He was lucky. He will choose to stay that way. But all of that comes later. Right now, the smell of burnt flesh and scorched wood is the overwhelming sensory input of the moment. Rico still cannot hear. He can't really see. The glimmering cinders on the wall move and shift, reshaping into the form of a snake-like man wearing a top hat. How much more do you want to see here, Cher? Rico has to see all of it, just like he saw it when it happened in real life. The Red Moon Mercs, he gets that. Live by the gun, die by the gun. It's the girls that bother him. They are small. They are young. Some younger than any corpse should be. And there's a room, far enough away from the center of the blast remain intact, but not far enough away to protect its occupants. It's a room several of the working girls used to protect that which they didn't want their clients and their business to sully. Last chance, boy. It sits on Rico's shoulder, neither angel nor devil. It whispers in his ear, simply an observer who has been a part of the scene many times before. Why not turn away this time? You don't need to look. You don't need to look. Rico's last chance to avoid this scene was long before now. It was years ago, when he had the choice to become something besides this besides a mercenary. Rico steps inside the room, and the same words echo hauntingly in his sleeping mind that echoed in the actual moment. Hi, one, help me. This is a nursery. Chapter 9. Fred when Fred woke, his pulse was normal. His breathing was calm, regular. Practice makes perfect, it seemed. Some of the dreams had come so often, they were like watching a familiar old movie. No surprises. This time, however, there were a few afterimages. That happened sometimes. He blinked them away, his eyelids shuddering between horrific still frames, until the past faded and the present reclaimed dominance, until all he saw was the flop house room's dingy ceiling. Fred sat up. His skin was damp here and there, but he wasn't sweating, not really. Usually the memories that plagued his dreams were gone as soon as he opened his eyes. Sometimes, however, he couldn't help reminiscing on those events and the ones that followed. Those girls. That nursery. The little kids. He couldn't do anything for them then, and he couldn't do anything now. If he hadn't been part of Red Moon, those same people would still be dead. Fred folded his legs into the lotus position. He rested his hands on his knees. He breathed in slow, let it out slower. There was no Loa in the real world. Here, 
He was his own guide, and he could control his thoughts. He could make those memories go away. He finished his short meditation, then stood. The memories hadn't gone anywhere. Fred sighed. Some forms of meditation were better than others. He reached under the room's lone chair and retrieved a shoulder rig. The blade of a knife whispered to him as he freed it from its sheath. He liked that sound. Not in any perverse or sadistic way. He liked that he could rely on it and what it meant. He liked the control. In the dark room, Fred settled into a fighting stance. He worked his body through an old knife drill from his days as a raw recruit. He struck at the vulnerable points on an invisible opponent standing in front of him, slashing and puncturing each one in sequence over and over again. Sternum, abdominal aorta, perineum, femoral artery, brachial punch, then pierce the mandible. Stab a man in the heart and loss of consciousness is instantaneous. Death follows in seconds. Stab him above the clavicle, and the blood will spray out so hard it will splash against the ceiling. Fred slashed and skewered his invisible opponent until a thin sheen of sweat covered his body. Now he was breathing hard, breathing hard in the good way of the here and now, not in the bad way of anguish and loss from which he would never be free. When he'd bled an entire imaginary legion dry, he finally stopped. Fred stood perfectly still for a moment, sucking wind, and staring at the vague outline of the wall in the darkness. Suddenly, he hurled the blade in his hand at the same wall. It struck with a loud, dull thud, buried several inches deep in the cheap plaster. Fred thought he heard some muffled, sleepy complaint from the occupant of the next room, but he ignored it. He left the knife there. He dropped down to sit on the edge of his bed. He held his skull in his hands. Chapter 10. The History of a People The McCovey Archives was a plain brown building forgotten by most. If Fred had learned one thing during his time in the mines, it was that the majority of people on this colony put little value on the past. Or the future, for that matter. They had nothing but the present. Here, life was short, and every moment had teeth of a hundred different shapes and sizes. People started each day wondering if they'd live to see the dawn. Fred always expected more resistance when it came to penetrating government buildings. There was usually better security and there was always more bullshit and bureaucracy. He was no master thief, no great cat burglar. He very rarely scaled walls or ziplined on the rooftops. His specialty was walking right through the front door and receiving a nod and a wave from every uniform he encountered. To do that here, he would need to have a good disguise and the documents to back it up. Fred started by spending some time at the McCovey coroner's office. It was a busy place. He posed as a mining rep, from Akma drilling, not wrinkled, saying he would stay out of the way. He just wanted to find methods to streamline the body delivery process. The first part of that, stay out of the way, was what the overworked coroner's office staff wanted to hear. The second part, streamline, was also music to the ears. If he could save them some work, even a little, they were happy to tolerate his presence. He learned what he needed to learn. The coroner was one of a few official offices that would have a reason to request access to the archive's records, although he noticed they rarely did. Fred took note of their procedures, and he took special note of the coroner's office workers themselves. He watched how they behaved and how people were used to them behaving. After that, it was a simple matter of forging the right credentials and papers and acquiring the right clothing. A few touches from his masquerade kit did the rest. When Fred walked through the rickety double doors of the archives, he was Dr. Edward Howe, assistant coroner. He was there to request files on a minor shipping magnate that died two weeks ago. The magnate had been a wealthy man, and two different women, both of whom had some pull with the shot collar and McCovey, were presenting as his wife and attempting to claim the body. Only the official family records could help the coroner's office clear things up. 
there was a single office clerk on duty at the archives' front desk. Fred had waited until the last shift to make his move, when staff was minimal. The rest of those on duty at this time were mostly janitorial staff. The clerk was a younger man, his attention fixed on a portable screen in his hands. From the sound, Fred thought he was watching a sporting event. Fred approached the desk. Hi there, Chief. I'm from the coroner's office, and dropping off for picking up. The clerk was less than interested. He didn't even take his eyes off the screen. Well, Fred began, a little thrown. I need to locate some records on... Records rooms down that hall, the clerk said, with a single jerk of his head to a large archway to the right. Fred looked at the entrance the kid had indicated. There wasn't even a door between them and the hallway beyond. The pragmatic part of him couldn't accept how easy this seemed, and maybe didn't want to accept that he had spent four days preparing his disguise and cover story for this. Do you need me to fill out a form or something? The clerk finally looked up. Look, man, if you can find whatever you need, you might as well just take it before it rots back there with the rest. Just don't expect me to know where to point you. I'm third shift. I've never even been in there. Thanks, Fred said and walked down the hall. Yep, four days wasted. That's what he got for not scouting the full mission before diving into preparation for a single part of it. The records room was suffering from terminal neglect. It was a tomb of scattered hard and soft copies that seemed to have almost no remaining order to any of it. A few moments of study made him realize the fact that looking for 20-year-old files was actually going to work in his favor. The older records were in much better shape than the more recent filings. It seemed as if the McCovey archives was a system progressively breaking down, and its condition had accelerated drastically in the last few years. Hacking their database proved to be the easy part. The technology was decades out of date, and there was little information here that anyone cared to protect. Most of the rich probably had their records kept elsewhere. Hell, they probably had their own system to handle deaths, even their own coroner. That was the way of things on McCovey. He tapped into the computer records. He attached a worm disk to the interface and set it to run cross-referencing Quentin's DNA with the names Quentin Barnes and Quincy Carbonaro. The program found a hit almost immediately, Killian Carbonaro. As Fred looked at the data, he understood why. Killian had been in the purest nation military. The nation didn't keep closed records on non-church citizens unless you were in the armed forces. Killian's DNA, just like Fred's, had been recorded as the main tracker for his military record. The common DNA sequences left no question. This was Quentin's father. Fred called up Killian's record, only to find that most of it was blank. His military record showed a date of induction, boot camp, and then nothing. Killian, my friend, what kind of work did they have you doing? Possibly something high level, something secret. No discipline record, no deployment record, no commendations, health exams, Nothing. A soldier with no military history? Such a thing didn't exist. Fred found a link to Killian's family. He let out a slow breath as he clicked it. This information was all so blank, he had hit a dead end. There wasn't much in the family record, but it wasn't blank. It read, Killian Carbonaro, birth date 2638, no death date. Wife, Constance Carbonaro. Birth date, 2637, no death date. Daughter, Janine Carbonaro. Birth date, 2654, no death date. Son, Quade Carbonaro, deceased. 2657 to 2657. Son, Quincy Carbonaro, deceased. 2659 to 2668. Son, Quentin Carbonaro, deceased. 2664 to 2669. No links, just names. No way to find out more about any of them, at least not from this record. Fred stared at the readout. It made him feel sad, but also hopeful. Sad because of so much loss. One boy who didn't make it past his first year, another dead at nine years old for stealing bread. 
Quentin was marked as dead, but that was probably a records error at the overburdened orphanage system. Maybe someone had done that as a kindness, to try and free him of his brother's debt. Whatever the reason, a five-year-old Quentin had been given a new name, and that new name had separated him from any connection with his real heritage. Hopeful, because there was no death record for the father, the mother, and the sister. Why hadn't Quentin ever mentioned a sister? Fred finally had something to work with. The computer database had nothing else, but he was surrounded by several tons of paper. Hard copy records that had probably never been entered into the computer. Paper. Just amazing how backward this place was. Fortunately, Fred came prepared. He dug a small rectangular device with an adhesive back from his kit. It was a combination high-intensity x-ray scanner and data retrieval program. Once attached, it would read every page in a stack five feet deep and scan each one for pre-programmed keywords and phrases. He entered the names into the scanner. That was the easy part. The real work that night turned out to be separating and stacking files so Fred could scan them. After ten minutes, he felt more like a mover than a military-trained private investigator. He was also working up a hell of a sweat. Maybe he should hire an assistant. In the movies, the investigator always had a young assistant who was willing to do the grunt work. He often entertained that thought, and, just as often, he chased it away. He had a lonely job, but at least he didn't have to bury anyone else. You work with someone, you get close to them get close to someone, you lose them. Fred never wanted to get close to anyone ever again. After three hours, he was beginning to consider he might be at this all night with no results when the scanner lit up in a deep, affirmative green. That meant a hit. He lifted the scanner from a stack of folders and checked its readout. The small screen displayed an image of a faded document that included the name Carbonaro. It also told Fred how deep into the current stack the image was taken. What Fred pulled from the stack turned out to be an official death record, but one that hadn't been fully filled out. Why can't it ever just be easy? The form had a last name, Carbonaro, and a sex designation, female, but no first name. There was also a destination for the remains, Grim Tyrant Valley. Which one was it? Constance or Janine? One of them was dead. Which would be worse news for Quentin, his mother or his sister? And what news did Fred have, really? Your mother or sister is dead for certain, but the other one is probably dead as well, even though I don't have a record of it. And, come to think of it, your father is also probably gone, because McCovey is the armpit of a system that is the armpit of the galaxy. No death record didn't mean a lot on McCovey. You were lucky if you got a grave, luckier if anyone documented your passing. Killian was probably just as dead as his wife, just as dead as his sons, just as dead as his daughter. No matter which one, sister or mother, Fred knew Quentin would be crushed. A starting Tier 1 quarterback, the face of a franchise, watched by billions and worshipped by millions. Yet for all of that... He was just a 20-year-old kid. Fred examined the piece of paper closer. There was a date field, but that corner had been torn off the form. There was one more field filled out. Remains received by Alistair Britton, Grim Tyrant Valley Sexton. Fred started to put the piece of paper back where it belonged when he heard the distinctive rush of air behind him. He only had a second to react, but it was more than enough. He picked up the biggest stack of files he could heft and swung it 180 degrees. It collided with the small, winged body that was attempting to dive-bomb the base of Fred's skull and sent it careening into the wall of the records room. That body hit hard and fluttered disjointedly to the floor. Fred reached under his coat and unsheathed his concealed karambit. He walked over to the body, reached down, and grabbed the thing by its wing, lifting and pinning it to the wall. Ghoulie! We gotta stop meeting like this. You've damaged two of my sensory pits, you ground-walking, milk-fed gashat. The final word was a garble. 
It had to be a hurrah insult that a speaker box couldn't accurately translate. You kiss your mother with that mouth? That is, if her I even have mothers, I gotta read up on my interspecies biology. Something metallic caught Fred's eye. He glanced at the floor. Down there was a small needle attached to a curved handle that fit the hurrah's mouth flaps. It was a syringe gun. If Gooley had gotten close enough, that needle would have probably gone right into Fred's back. Gooley, what's in the syringe? What syringe? Fred actually laughed and was surprised by the sound. You know, Gooley, I should clip these wings of yours, but I'm not going to do that. Do you know why? Because you know I'm connected and that you'd be killed for it? No. And you're not really that connected, Gooley, or you wouldn't be doing a job on shucking McCovey, where your kind would be killed by most of the sentients here. I'm guessing you're here because you owe someone a favor. Someone powerful. Am I right? Then I don't know why you're not going to clip me, he said, avoiding the question about who had hired him. I'm not going to kill you out of professional courtesy, Fred said. Whatever else you might be, you're a specialist, like me. A very skilled one at that. And that's something I value even if you don't. For once, Gooley seemed speechless. Perhaps it was because he couldn't tell if Fred was being honest. Fred then slowly twisted Gooley's wing until the little hurrah hissed in pain. However, Fred said, professional courtesy extends only so far. I'm going to pretend that whatever is in that syringe wouldn't do me any harm because if I found out you were trying to kill me, Let's just say that Sklorno are not the only species that likes the taste of hurrah. You keep putting yourself in front of me, and your second-story days will be over. Fred pantomimed slicing the wings from Gooley's body to emphasize the point, then released him. Gooley's wings began undulating in counterclockwise circles. They carried him up into the air and backed him slowly away from Fred. You're a good sentient, Rico, Gooley said. Too good for our line of business. I wish I could thank you for giving me a break just now. Why don't you? Manners are an important part of civilized interaction. Because I don't think I'll get the chance, Gooley said. What's that supposed to mean? A shock stick lit up his hand, making him drop the karambit as a huge human arm slid in fast around his neck. The big body attached to that arm drove Fred face first into the records room wall. Fast, strong, experienced, Fred knew he was in trouble. He couldn't get to his blades. The man's weight pressed him into the wall, and the big left arm around his throat started to squeeze boa constrictor tight until both blood and oxygen were cut off. Fred felt the darkness coming on. If he didn't move fast, he would never move again. Stay calm and act. You have at least five seconds until you pass out. His hand slithered up, trembling but steady as they sought his attacker's left arm, the one securing his head. Fred closed his fists around the man's wrist. The grip in which he was caught was as solid as a statue's, but Fred dug his fingers into the nerves there, mining them with his fingernails, until he heard the man hiss in surprised pain. The chokehold loosened. Fred pushed off the wall as hard as he could, simultaneously twisting to the right, toward the man, his cheek now on the man's chest. That released the pressure on his windpipe. He sucked in a big breath, felt the blood rush to his brain, but he was still in a steel-strong headlock. Fred's hands shot inside his coat for his knives, but before he could pull them free, a giant right fist slammed into his mouth. A second blow broke his nose, made him see swirls of black. He felt the man rear back for a third blast. Desperate, Fred grabbed at the hand holding him in the headlock, isolated a finger, and yanked. The sound of a pinky snapping joined the man's deep scream of pain. The headlock finally released. Fred drove his elbow up and back. He expected the solid impact of bone on bone, but his elbow hissed through open air. The man had ducked, the move of a boxer bending at the knees. Fred never saw the man's face, but the feel of that move alone gave him a split-second warning as to what was coming next. Enough time to know he was in trouble— not enough time to do anything about it. The uppercut caught him under the tip of the chin, snapping his head back, lifting him off his feet and throwing him into a stack of files. He flailed weakly as paper poured down on and around him. He moved like a drunken man swimming, trying to find some way to stand. The room spun. He couldn't see. 
My knives. His hands slid to his sheaths. Each came out holding a blade. He blinked madly as he waved the knives at nothing, stabbed them in the direction of the big man, hoping to catch the enemy coming in. Fred's feet found their way beneath him. He stumbled to a crouching stance, still swinging and stabbing and slashing at whatever might come his way. A few more blinks, and his head cleared a little. He could see again, see enough to know he was alone. The big man was gone. Fred had never seen the man's face. Fred looked to the stack of papers where he'd been working on the incomplete death form. The piece of paper was gone. So, too, was his worm device. Gooly, you crafty bastard. Hey, mister, called a familiar voice from the other side of the records room. It was the clerk from the lobby. What are you doing back here? If you break anything, it's going to be my ass. Fred realized the lazy clerk might well have inadvertently saved his life. Maybe the big man in the suit didn't want to kill someone in front of a government witness. Whatever the reason, Fred wasn't sticking around to find out. He stood on rubber legs. The clerk saw the knives in his hands. Hey, he said, backing away. Just, just take it easy. No need for that. Fred sneezed, felt globs of blood land on his chin. He slid the knives back into their sheaths. He forced his feet, which suddenly seemed to be made of wet clay, to start running to carry him out of the records room. The clerk made some kind of protest, but it was a half-hearted protest at best. Few people wanted to press an argument with someone who carried big knives. Maybe Fred hadn't scouted the clerk, but he had cased the building. There were three ways out. He opted for a back door that led to a parking area. By the time he reached that door, his head had fully cleared allowing him to both see straight and to fully experience the newfound pain radiating through his nose and face. He looked outside. He didn't see the big man or Ghoulie, just the usual stream of robed Macovians and the endless parade of dirty, skinny orphans. The sun was on its way down. Only a few minutes of fading daylight remained. Fred ran across the parking lot, headed for the shadows, and a long zigzaggy route back to his flop house. He needed to gather up his equipment. He had to find Alistair Britton, sexton of Grim Tyrant Valley, and he had to find him fast. Britton might be the only person who knew the whereabouts of Quentin's mother and or sister. Fred knew that, and now so did Gooley. That meant Gooley's employer knew it, too. But Fred also had names, had to ask around about Janine and Constance. Something told him asking about Killian was a bad idea. There was a reason that man had a blank military record. Fred couldn't be in two places at once. Right about now, that concept of a helpful assistant sounded better than ever. But maybe he could get some help. Not an assistant, just a one-time hire. He grabbed his gear and headed for the mines. Chapter 11. Carney. Enough people worked at the mines that slipping in among them was never a problem, and it never aroused suspicion. Even though Caleb had ceased to exist, no one gave Fred a second glance. Working as a one-man operation provided certain advantages. He didn't have to pay anyone else, he never needed to have meetings or corporate planning sessions, and he never needed to get anyone's approval to follow the best course of action. But it also had its drawbacks, the biggest of which was that he couldn't be in two places at once. Sometimes you just had to get help. Fred found Carney in the quarry, watching the evening pit fights, sipping stinger juice and cheering with the rest. Inside the circle, a burly, shockingly alabaster-skinned miner was getting his lunch eaten by a slightly younger man who obviously knew a thing or two about the ancient earth art of Savate. Fred sidled up to Carney. Caleb, Carney said quietly, almost conspiratorially. What not here, Fred told the younger man. I need to talk to you for a minute. Carney nodded, following Fred through the crowd and a few yards up the sloping quarry wall. When Carney spoke next, he was a little out of breath. Fred didn't think it was from the slight climb. 
I figured you for gone, man. Not just from the mines, but maybe from the colony, too. That's next, Fred said. First, I need your help with something. Carney looked excited. Sure, man. Anything. I have a job for you. A job that will get you off of McCovey. Away from McCovey? Fred nodded. With... with you? The young man would have to ask that. No, not with me. The job pays enough for you to buy a ticket off this rock. Are you in? Carney didn't hesitate. I've been waiting all my life to get out of here. What do you need me to do? Is it dangerous? Fred nodded. Yeah, it is. I need you to ask around about two names. Janine Carbonaro, 30 years old, and Constance Carbonaro, 45. Easy enough. I can talk to the guys around here, and— Not the guys, Fred said. The girls. Talk only to the girls. Carney seemed confused. What girls? Why? Wives. Daughters. Janine might not be around anymore, but she would have grown up here. She had to have friends. Constance was her mother, and I think Constance died 15 years ago. That means someone might have taken Janine in. If you want out of here, you have to ask around and find out. Why would anyone talk to me? Listen, you're a good-looking guy. Don't tell me the women around the mine aren't into you. Carney went from confused to embarrassed. Yeah, well, just try for me, all right? All right. I'll hit the market and the replenishing stations. A lot of the miners' wives and daughters work there. Thanks, Fred said. I appreciate it. I need anything you can get as fast as you can get it. I have to go take care of some business. You familiar with Mr. Sam's Barbecue? The place with the brisket? Yeah, I know it. Good. Look for me there tomorrow night, an hour after sunset. If I'm not there, just leave. Come back the next night and look for me again. If you don't see me that second night, don't bother, because I'm not around anymore. Carney's eyes widened. Not around? You mean dead? Fred laughed. I hope not. I mean, I just can't get to the restaurant and I'll track you down later, okay? Now, can you do this for me? Carney sighed. He looked relieved to know that Fred wouldn't be in danger. I can. He hesitated and then said, Who is she, Caleb? Why do you need to find her? I can't tell you. Can you trust me on this? Carney nodded solemnly. I do. I trust you. Those words gave Fred a gnawing feeling in his gut and a distinct pang in his chest. He felt like he was using the kid. In truth, he was. Fred did honestly like Carney, probably more than he should, but he was exploiting the kid's feelings to get information. It was part of the job, but that didn't mean Fred liked it. Chapter 12. The Grave Digger Damn, son! You can make this thing move! The tires of the sand rail skimmed the brittle, purple dunes with the wild speed of cannon-fired stones skipping across the surface of a pond. The rail topped 65 kilometers per hour just as the McCovey sun began to melt into the horizon. Fred piloted the desert vehicle as easily as he jockeyed the stick of the Archangel. He didn't attempt to steer as much as to keep it from launching into a barrel roll with each rise and fall across the 15-meter dunes. The rail was a rental, but he didn't think Mr. Nathaniel Corner Sr. would get his security deposit back. The reason for pushing the throttle past the red line was beginning to gain on them. Another sand rail, larger and covered in armor plating, had tried to slice Fred's vehicle in half just minutes before. To Fred's right, strapped firmly into the passenger seat, the old gravedigger seemed to be having the time of his life. He was either unaware that they were under attack, or he'd ceased to fear death more than the boredom of his advanced age. Fred had gotten to Alistair Britain first. The old man lived in the desert, commuting over an hour each way to the graveyard he managed. Fred had found the old man swilling stinger juice in front of a dilapidated trailer that was slowly sinking into the side of a dune. Fred had been there only 15 minutes when they had both seen the sun reflecting off a much larger, much faster sand rail, clearly heading toward the old man's isolated home. Fred took one minute to explain why he'd come, one more minute to explain who he thought might be on that bigger sand rail. 
the old man had spent five seconds making up his mind to get the hell out of there. Their pursuer, Sandriel, had more than armor plates. It also had a very powerful engine. Fred had bought some room with clever maneuvering, but in a flat-out sprint, his ride didn't have enough power to pull away. He was only seconds from being mowed down like so much roadkill. If the sprint wouldn't do it, he had to go back to what he did better than anyone else. He had to drive. Fred pushed the stick right, sending his lighter rail into a wide curve. The rail's thick tires kicked up an arcing fishtail of purple sand, sand that caught the fading sun in a moving, sparkling wave. His pursuers tried to match the curve, their fishtail even bigger, even higher. Fred glanced back to see the big machine's blunt nose closing in, so he threw his body left at the same time he pushed the joystick in that direction. Oh! the old gravedigger shouted as G4 slammed him tight against his restraints. The rail gracefully cut into the left-hand turn of the larger S-curve. The pursuers again tried to follow, but couldn't quite match the tighter turn. Fred timed it, waiting for his vehicle to start ascending a dune face. Hang on, he said, then pulled the lever for the brakes. Flat fins of metal shot out of the rail's bottom and dug into the thick sand. Fred's body slammed forward against the restraints as the rail ground to a sudden halt. With the squeal of metal and a head-jarring thump, the pursuing rail's left side ground along the rear right corner of Fred's rail. A secondary thump rocked Fred's rail forward to teeter on the dune crest, but the pursuing vehicle sailed past that crest and knocked off balance from the impact. It rolled sideways down the dune face, tumbling and spinning and kicking up huge sprays of purple sand. Fred pushed the brake lever back down, making the fins recede into their housing. He gunned the engine. His rail rocketed down the dune face. He swung left to avoid his still-rolling pursuers, then shot away at top speed. Ha one's eyes, the old man said. You kill him? We'll know if they stay put, Fred said. If they start firing on us, probably not. The rail shot over a high dune and caught air before Fred expertly brought its wheels back to the downslope. The engine roared inside its sandproof housing. This was dangerous, deadly work, but he liked this machine. If he lived through this, he might come back sometime and do it again. It would probably be more fun if someone wasn't trying to murder him. I thought you was going to kill us, the old-timer said. But that move, you done this kind of thing before, boy? Sort of, was the fairest answer Fred could come up with under the circumstance. The day's light was rapidly fading. The rail's headlamps came on automatically, but Fred overrode the control to shut them off. For a few minutes, he lost sight of their pursuers. He even started to think they were in the clear. Then a cluster of lights appeared in the distance behind them. I guess you didn't kill him, the old-timer said. Guess not. I can't dodge him forever. We've got about a five-minute lead at best. They're going to catch us. Then what happens? I probably get tortured, Fred said. You into that kind of thing? Fred shook his head. Nope. Sucks to be you, the old-timer said. What happens to me? You? Don't worry. They won't torture you. They'll just shoot you in the head. The old man spit out the side. I figured, since I ain't into getting shot in the head, he pointed northwest. Maybe you want to go that way. We might make the decom grounds. Decom grounds? Hey, yep, the old man said. Where the bats dropped all McCovey's heavy weaponry after the takeover. Bombs, missiles, mines, that kind of thing. All of it deactivated? The old-timer laughed. You're a picky one, ain't you? Some of it's deactivated. I figure maybe getting blown up by some old mine is better than definitely getting shot in the head. Unless you change your mind about digging torture, I figured your kind might be into that. Fred pointed the rail northwest. The molten mess of the setting sun was just off-center left, most of it already dropping behind the horizon. My kind, Fred said. What's that supposed to mean? Oh, give me a break, Sonny. I've been around a long time. Just because it's scripture to hate you don't mean it's the right thing to do. Scriptures also tell me I ain't supposed to eat round bug because they're unclean, but I like me a good sandwich. It sounded like a conversation Fred might like to have sometime. Some other time, when he didn't have the lights of a hostile sand rail steadily closing in on his rear. 
Brad pushed his foot down harder, even though the acceleration pedal couldn't go any farther unless he kicked it through the floor plate. A few minutes later, Fred's rail crested a dune. Instead of seeing another dark sand wave ahead, the surface before him sloped down, down, and down. He was driving into a massive pit. Far ahead, at the bottom, he saw huge, dark shapes rising out of the sand. High one, he said. What are those towers? Ships, the old-timer said. They buried some of those there as well. There were a few wonderful seconds of nothing but darkness behind them, then their pursuers crested the rim. Those same lights in his rearview mirror, only closer. And then, a new light flashed. Instincts born in training and forged in dogfights kicked in. Fred cut hard left as he worked the brakes, bleeding speed and angling away from their straight path. A flash of light appeared in their original path, molten orange, followed by a cascade of liquid purple glass. Hot damn, the old man said. They shooting at us. Fred turned the rail right, again pointing to the towering buried ships. He demanded the machine give him all the speed it had. The pursuers had not only recovered, they were firing a shucking plasma cannon. He had to get off the dunes. The closer the pursuers got, the less time he'd have to dodge the fire, and one did not survive a direct hit from a weapon like that. Whoever wanted the information Fred was chasing down wanted it badly. Firing off an energy weapon like that on a colony that was armed solely with nail guns was going to raise hell, even draw the attention of the Kretorakian overlords who really ran the place. Whoever his pursuers were, they were willing to risk drawing a patrol of bats and their entropic rifles to bring Fred down. The dead ships rose up high in front of them. He'd served in the Corps. He knew that these ships weren't all that big. Maybe a couple of corvettes, the big one in the middle, a frigate at best. But small, up in orbit, in comparison to the destroyers and cruisers, was a completely different thing down on the ground. Not far now. The rail's headlights played off a distant, battered wall. The old-timer pointed. There! Aim for that crack in the fence! Fred did. So close now. So close, if he could just dodge the next round. Another flash, bright against the early night sky far behind. Fred cut hard left and dropped speed, hoping the gunner was new enough to fall for the same trick twice. The gunner was not. A blast of energy erupted close behind and to the right. The sand rail's rear flipped high into the air. Up they went, flipping end over end, rising to the sky for a moment before gravity won that brief battle as it always did. The seat restraint slammed him into his chair, even as crash gel poured out of a dozen hidden nozzles, coating him in an already hardening goo. Beside him, the old gravedigger let out a loose cry of elation that was downright giddy. Time seemed to slow to a crawl for Fred. He certainly didn't feel giddy, but neither did he feel afraid or angry or even concerned. No, he simply experienced one of those moments in which you question how your choices have led you to wherever you found yourself. Somewhere beneath him, the DCOM ground's outer wall passed by. An eternal handful of seconds later, the spinning rail crashed into the DCOM grounds. Chapter 13. The Elephant's Graveyard Someone slapped Fred in the face. Wake up, kid! The old-timer's voice, but whispering, not the shrill screech it had been during the sandrail chase. Fred's eyes blinked open. He was upside down, half hanging from seat restraints, half held in place by the hardened crash fiber. The old man was pulling away chunks of the thick fiber, trying to free Fred enough to move. It was dark. Too dark to see much of anything. We're not dead, Fred said. Can't put that one past you, the old-timer said. I'll give credit where credit is due, son. You're the best driver I ever saw, but we just got plain lucky. The old man hit the release button on Fred's restraints. Fred dropped in a heap on his head, then awkwardly rolled to his side. He looked up, looked around. The upside-down rail had slammed nose-first into some kind of container, punching through the thin metal and crunching to a stop. 
Fred saw the vehicle's entry hole and, beyond it, McCovey's three purple moons. I can hear them shuckers out there looking for us, the old man said. Hopefully things just can't take care of themselves. And how would that happen? This is a dumping ground for illegal weapons. Sometimes things have a tendency to go boom. The digger made a mushroom cloud with his hands and the sound of a massive explosion with his mouth that ended up sounding more like a raspberry. Fred heard the sound of an engine echoing through the site. Their pursuers were close. He carefully got to his feet, his body throbbing complaint. The container was full of some kind of artillery shells. He had to step carefully to find purchase on the curved surfaces and hoped that these rounds, at least, had been fully diffused. He reached the edge of the hole made by the rail and looked out. Wrecks and husks stretched out at least a kilometer before him, a graveyard of the purest nation's once aggressive ways. Ill-formed roads snaked between the machines of death, some mostly blocked by windswept dunes. So much hardware, and none of it had mattered when the millions of Kretorakian soldiers swept across the deserts and plains like a plague of ten-pound locusts, each carrying a deadly entropic rifle. But all of that was long before Fred's time. He felt no loss at the nation's former glory. Behind him, he heard the clang of a foot rolling off a shell. The old man caught up to him, looked out. The lights of their pursuer's sandrail played against the hull of an old shuttle, then the machine turned the corner and came into view. Fred saw the plasma cannon gunner, his petty palp hands gripping the controls of the powerful weapon. The old-timer elbowed Fred and whispered, Hi, that's a quiff. Can't put one past you, Fred whispered back. That's an alien. Aliens aren't allowed on McCovey. You don't say. I don't know what you did, the old-timer said, but you must have pissed off the wrong guy if someone sent a quith here. Fred nodded. He had pissed off the wrong guy. He just didn't know who that guy was. Then, a bony hand wrapped tight around his mouth. He started to react, automatically bringing his elbow up to drive it into the old-timer's throat, but stopped himself a split second before killing the man. Shh! The old-timer hissed, so quiet it was almost inaudible. Don't move a muscle. Fred's body tensed. He wasn't used to letting anyone touch him, ever, but then he heard it. He heard the flapping and fluttering of wings. Bats. A stream of the horrific little creatures flew across Fred's field of vision, from left to right, heading for the crawler down below. They came so close, he felt the air from their wings. In that moment, Fred felt the instinctive fear he shared with two generations of Nationalites born since the takeover. When the bats are close, you don't move. You don't give them any reason to think you're a threat. The last one passed by. The old man's hand slid away. Fred looked down, more with his eyes than with his whole head. A flash of amber light. The blast of an entropic rifle sizzling into the purple sand just to the side of the pursuing sandrail. Kretorakins didn't always tell you to stay still. Sometimes they led with a warning shot. Anyone in the purest nation knew that. The Quith Warrior was not from the purest nation. The big warrior pivoted the plasma cannon, turning to face the threat. He didn't even complete the turn before three more amber blasts hit him. The first struck his right petty palp arm, the second his center chest, the third his right leg. The warrior let out the quith equivalent of a scream, a barking, grinding sound that Fred would not soon forget. The petty palp arm dissolved, and a hand fell away to the rail's rear deck, still fizzling and disintegrating as the entropic effect crawled down the forearm. Maybe the reaction would run out of steam before it reached the fingers, or maybe the whole hand would just vanish in a puff of atoms. The shot in the chest, of course, was what killed him. The expanding hole first cut off that scream, then ended his life. His body slumped to the deck, what was left of his chest evaporating away just like the severed hand. The rail shot forward but didn't get far. Fred watched, knowing what was coming. Once the bats started firing, they didn't stop until everyone in front of them was dead. He didn't see the shot that killed the driver, but he heard the scream. Fred and the old-timer sat very, 
very still. They breathed slowly. They focused on making no noise at all. The echoes of the screams faded, then died away. Fred could hear his own heartbeat in the faint hiss of the desert wind sliding across fine sand. Then, a few minutes later, they heard the flapping of wings fading away into the distance. The old-timer let out a slow hiss of air. He spoke, no longer in a whisper, but not very loud either. I wish I could say I feel bad about those spawns of Satan getting vaped, but I don't. Spawns of Satan? I thought you just said because something is in the scripture doesn't mean it's right. Not all things are right, the old man said. Some are. Or at least in the case of aliens chasing me down and trying to kill me, the scriptures are dead on. Fred nodded. Can't argue with that. So, how far to the graveyard? We're in the graveyard. The one for people, Fred said. The one that you run. Well, if we walk, we might make it before daybreak. I know you're not from here, young gun, but I'll say you don't want to be on foot on the purple sand when the sun comes up. How far of a drive? The old man tilted his head back toward the sand rail embedded in the container wall. I ain't much of a mechanic if that's what you're asking. You don't have to be a mechanic, Fred said. He pointed down to the larger sand rail below. You just have to be good with a mop and a bucket. The old man stared down, then nodded. Uh, yep, I guess if we wait an hour, the bats be truly gone. They won't come back if no one fires off that plasma cannon. I'll do my best not to pull the trigger. The old-timer sighed. Well, this is going to be messy, but then again, cleaning up dead bodies is what I do for a living. Let's get it done. And while we're at it, do watch your step. I'm pretty sure the shells we're standing on are live. Chapter 14 Stacks, Skulls, and Stones Aside from the general stickiness and bits of flesh they hadn't cleaned up, the borrowed sand rail was quite a nice machine. Fred enjoyed the ride. He just tried not to think too much about why the seat was a little damp. He wished he could sell it. The thing was brand new and would fetch a great price, but to show up anywhere civilized with this thing was the same as saying, I killed the original owners. Fortunately. If there was any civilization around, it was out of range of sight. The sun was just coming up over the purple sand as Fred and the old-timer reached the graveyard. I hope this was worth it, Fred said. I know those warriors would have put a hurting on us, but a lot of people want to hurt me. I could buy just fine avoiding them as opposed to seeing sentience die. I can give you what you need, the digger assured him. Don't worry about that. See that big rock over there? The one on top of that high dune? Pull up to the rod of that, but go slow, and don't drive past the rock. Fred did as he was told. Like the sand, most rocks in this area were purple. This one was lined with crystals of quartz that reflected the morning sun. The sand rail slowed to a stop, kicking up a few whirling dervishes of purple dust. Fred killed the engine and waited for the desert wind to take the dust away. A valley stretched in every direction below them. Fred saw dark cracks in the soil, huge black veins everywhere he looked. Once, centuries or even eons ago, this might have been a lake, or even an ocean. Now it was equal parts super cemetery and human landfill. Welcome to McCovey's second biggest industry, son, the digger said. This is Grim Tyrant Valley. The graves numbered in the tens of thousands. Most were cheap wooden crosses slapped together with nails and glue. Those were broken up here and there by modest headstones, small crescents of hand-carved rock made by the families of the deceased. Fred estimated they were outnumbered by the discount crosses twenty to one. As many graves as might have been dug and marked down there, however, they were nothing compared to the number of bodies that were piled stories high at regular intervals across the valley. Fred couldn't smell them. Dampening filters erected on tall poles surrounded the perimeter of the valley, but he could see the deep levels of decomposition in most of them, as if they'd been lying there for a year or more. Then he spotted the piles. There were nothing but broken skeletons. He didn't have to say anything. The old man could read it plainly on his face. Budget cuts, the digger explained. 
About a decade ago, I had a staff of 23. Now I got a staff of five. The backlist of bodies is a mile long. We get to them as we're able. But I promise you, whatever state they're in, every single departed soul you see down there will get their day. I'll put them all on the ground eventually. At the far end of the valley, Fred saw a hover barge approaching. Rusted and well used, it was the kind of vehicle that hauled all sorts of things. On it, he saw two logos the twin green crescents of Ringgold Incorporated, and a symbol that had been universally known across human space since even before the days of spaceflight, the biohazard symbol. The barge closed in in the sprawling graveyard. Down on a concrete slab strewn with curls of purple sand, a man waved two handheld orange cones at the barge. The battered machine closed in and stopped above the slab. The man ran out of the way, then the barge's bottom doors opened. Bodies spilled out. Fred guessed there were thirty, maybe forty, all landing in a pile of lifeless humanity. He felt numb. Mine workers, he asked, as if that mattered. Probably eighty percent, the digger confirmed. Maybe more. Fred was ghost pale and his voice came out in a rasp. He gestured to the whole valley, to the sprawl of crosses and monuments, to the piles of skeletons and rotted bodies, to the freshly dropped miners. How in the hell could you possibly find anyone in all of that? It's my life's work, boy, the old-timer said. Now, you wanted this. Shall we get on with it or what? Fred realized the old man was right. This was his choice, and what could be the last piece of the puzzle might be down there somewhere. Which way? he asked the old-timer. The man pointed out a path that led down the valley to the operation below. Fred put the rail in drive, and they started down. Chapter 15. Family Frederico understood the concept of death. He understood it far more than most. He had killed. He had watched friends die in battle, seen sentience executed for no reason at all. Much of his life, in fact, had revolved around death, dealing with it or dealing it out. Now, however, he understood he'd been dealing with a lowercase d death. In Grim Tyrant Valley, he saw what capital D death was all about. Fred and the gravedigger had spent hours walking through dirt paths that wound through the stacks and piles of corpses that made up Grim Tyrant Valley. All of McCoby's dead wound up here. So many, in all stages of decomposition, and, worst of all, the smell. The gravedigger gave Fred a soiled cloth to hold over his nose and mouth. Smell didn't seem to bother the old-timer at all. Fred felt choked by it, and not just his lungs. His entire body and brain felt oppressed by this place, as if the death was constantly closing in around him, threatening to crush him, make him part of the landscape. The whole place was a giant, blaring message that death is coming for you, and there is nothing you can do about it. Fred might have been overwhelmed by it, but the calm of the gravedigger kept him tethered. He focused on the old man, who might have been strolling through a garden in which he took great pride. Still, the number of plots and people was staggering. Fred couldn't imagine ever finding a single one in this place. After fifteen minutes of walking, the stacks of unprocessed bodies gave way to an endless vista of cheap gravestones. Not granite, oh no, these were made from McCovey's version of limestone. If you were poor, they wouldn't even waste good rock on you. Fred tried to estimate the number of graves, but gave up almost immediately. They were uncountable. The old man didn't seem phased by the vista of death, however. He seemed to know exactly where he was going. More than that, as they walked past each grave, whether they were marked with an epitaph or not, the digger recited names, droning them like the refrain of some dour church song. Horace and Malachi, Harrell Barbara, Migliorelli Paul, Urich Philip. How do you do that? Fred asked after the first twenty or thirty names. The old man seemed annoyed by the interruption. I told you, this here's my life's work. Not just seeing them put by, 
but seeing that at least one body remembers who they was. How much farther? You worry too much about distance, boy. Look around. We all end up in the same place. Fred assumed the old man was using Grim Tyrant Valley as a metaphor because no way Fred would ever wind up here. His mortal remains forever on McCovey? He'd rather wind up as Sklorno Poop. The gravedigger went on reciting names. Fred's count reached deeply into the hundreds as the day wore on. They had to walk for hours to find it. Fred lost all sense of direction, and he had to trust that the old man would be able to get them back to the sand rail. Finally, the old man stopped in front of a grave. He pointed to the headstone, which was just beginning to show the rounding effects of weathering. There she is, he said. Constance Carbonaro. Fred's stomach hurt from the constant intake of the stench. Limestone. Not even the granite that he'd spent weeks chipping at while posing as a mine worker. In large lettering, the name Constance Carbonaro was pounded into the stone across the top. Below that was another inscription. It read, Beloved Mother and Wife of Killian. That's her, Fred said. The old man looked triumphant. Told you. Killian, the husband. Is there one for him in this place? The digger shook his head. He ain't buried. Less than he's still on the pile, he ain't here. Sometimes they turn to bone before we can properly get to them. Then if they don't have an identship, it's hard to figure out who they were. Fred grimaced beneath the handcloth. Based on that, he made the odds 50-50 on whether or not Quentin's father was in Grim Tyrant Valley. Fred looked around again, taking in the sprawling expanse of headstones. Has anyone else been looking through here lately? You mean like those insect-looking fellers tried to blow us up recently? Yeah, exactly like that. Haven't heard nothing. Fred nodded. He was quiet for a long time, considering, weighing, judging. Finally, he said, If she didn't have a marked grave, would you still remember where she is? The digger tapped a withered fingertip against the deep, wrinkled lines of his temple. I ain't ever forgot one I put in the ground. Good. I need you to trust me on something. What's that? Without answering, Fred raised his booted foot and smashed it into the marker. It fell back, already broken in two. Fred stomped both of the pieces, hitting it again and again until the letters were shattered, and even then, he used his heel to ground anything that resembled the letter into reddish powder. The old gravedigger said nothing. Neither did his eye seem to judge Fred's actions. The headstones weren't the gravedigger's business. His business was remembrance. Still, it was a crappy thing to do. But, Fred decided, if Quentin wanted to return for his mother or mark her grave, he could. The old man would know where to find her. Right now, it was more important to Fred to keep any and all intel he could out of the enemy's hands, whomever that enemy was. He had gathered enough information that it was time to communicate with his employer. It was time to report to Quentin. But with Greedock the Splithead's goons always watching the Kraken's QB, it wasn't as easy as making the five-day trip from McCovey to Ionath and having lunch. Well, sometimes it was that easy, but the odds were that the quith he dealt with in the old shipyard had worked for Greedock. Best to be cautious, get Quentin off Ionath altogether, and also probably best not to contact the kid directly. To make that happen, Fred had to call in a favor from one Rachel Gesford, commissioner of Dinolition. Chapter 16 Carney. Fred had scheduled transport to Wilson 6. Dinolition was a crude thing, more barbarism than sport, but a certain type of person loved it. Dinolition was growing in popularity. Soon it might spread galaxy-wide, but for now there were few places to see it. One of those was the desolate area of Wilson 6 known as the Wastes. Dinolition was popular enough that people traveled there regularly to see the genetically engineered monsters duke it out. Fred raised no suspicion when he booked travel to Wilson 6 under yet another assumed name. But before he departed McCovey, he had to see if Carney had found anything. And if that meant another round of food at Mr. Sam's, well, that was yet another expensive meal. 
Hopefully, Quentin wouldn't mind if Fred was a big tipper. Sunset came and went. A good two hours after darkness fell, Fred sat at a table at Mr. Sam's, a half-eaten slab of ribs in front of him. After a while, nothing but bones remained, and still no sign of Carney. Mr. Sam sat behind his counter, watching Fred eat. It should have felt uncomfortable, but Mr. Sam watched people eat the way a master painter watched people admire his work. Fred was ready to give up and head for the shuttle port when the door swung wide open and Carney came rushing in like a man late for an important date. He spotted Fred, and relief seemed to wash over him. He headed for the table. "'What'll you take, son?' Mr. Sam asked automatically from behind the counter. Carney was stopped dead by the question. Then he looked on the verge of panic. "'Uh, I don't have any money.' Fred came to his rescue. "'Get him some brisket, will you, Mr. Sam?' The kindly proprietor nodded his bulbous chin. Coming right up. Carney slipped into a chair across from Fred, smiling. I don't need to eat. It's the least I can do. Looks like you've been running around some. Fred let the kid get some food and drink in before he pressed Carney about what, if any, information he'd been able to gather. I asked around, Carney said, around a mouthful of brisket. The women at the replenishing stations loved to talk, but it seemed like none of them had anything to say about the girl. They spent all day asking around. I was ready to give it up. I wasn't even going to come here. Then I got lucky. I found an old friend of hers from when they were kids. Fred's synapses began to fire a little faster upon hearing that. His instinct was to dig into Carney and squeeze every relevant fact out of him, but he stayed silent and let the kid finish on his own. The woman's name is Amanda, Carney said. Amanda Sparrow. She's around the age you said. Anyway, Amanda said Jenny, Janine, ran away years ago. Ran away where? She said Janine talked about stowing away and making it to Quith Space. Said that was the last time anyone saw her. Fred frowned. That wasn't a lead. It was a fairy tale. Janine could be anywhere. Anything might have happened to her in the intervening years. Thanks for trying, Carney. Can't win them all, I guess. You don't understand, Carney said. She made it out. She left Purest Nation Space. She got all the way to the Quith homeworld. She's probably still there now. How could you possibly know that? Carney reached inside his shirt, being very careful, as if he were concealing something alive in there. What he removed, however, was a plain-looking piece of folded paper. Amanda got a letter from her. Fred found he couldn't even process that. Not an electronic message, something to travel at the speed of light, but a physical piece of paper. Moved, presumably, from Quith space to the outskirts of the Purest Nation. It wasn't possible. How could she have sent a letter here? Carney took another bite of brisket. He talked with his mouth full, and Fred didn't care. You know how it is. Aliens aren't supposed to set foot on Purest Nation soil and all that, but that doesn't mean most of the black market goods around the colony don't come from their ships. There's a lot of folks who pay to get word to the people they had to leave behind. Carney handed over the aged piece of paper. Amanda didn't want to give it up at first, he said. I had to trade her all the store tokens I had on me. Plus, I got to go on a date with one of her sisters. Any other time, Fred might have laughed at that last bit. But right then, his focus was like a laser pointed at that letter. He unfolded it. The handwriting was young and feminine. He flashed on that right away. Turning it over carefully in his hands, he noted the wear seemed natural and authentic. There was no last name, but it was signed Janine. He read it. Janine spoke of bribing a freighter captain to smuggle her off McCovey into Red Storm City in the Jupiter Net Colony. She didn't specify what she'd bribed him with or how. Fred didn't want to know that detail, and he was sure Quentin wouldn't either. Janine went on to write about finding a job as a waitress in a nightclub called Halftimers in Red Storm City's manufacturing district. And she spoke of a brother, one who'd been executed for stealing food. She wrote that she still thought about him at night. It was enough. More than enough, in fact. Carney, this is... Fred found he genuinely didn't have the words. Except for two. Thank you. No problem, man. 
I'm happy I could deliver. Fred took out a handful of credits. Let me pay you for your time and trouble. I don't want that, Carney said immediately. Fred placed the credits on the table in front of him. Take them, he insisted. You earned it. Carney didn't protest further. You sure you gotta go? You could crash at my place tonight. Fred was already tucking the letter away and gathering his gear. It's still not the right time, Carn. Carney nodded. I figured you'd say that. You've been a big help, Fred said, and he meant it. I won't forget that. Or you. On the transport to Wilson 6, Fred read and reread that letter at least a dozen times. There was nothing concrete about this lead, but it seemed so convincing. Should he tell Quentin about it? No, not yet. It would be enough of a shock when Quentin heard about his mother. Fred didn't need to compound the situation with news of an unknown sister that might, or might not, still be alive. Once Fred finished on Wilson 6, he would track the letter back to its source. For now, though, he would only report the things that he knew to be true. Book 3. Wilson 4. Chapter 17. Quentin. The roar of a stadium crowd filtered into the empty bathroom, played off the tile walls. Fred had his hands deep in the nanite machine's inner workings. He was trying to fix the fabricator. He'd put up the out-of-order signs to keep people out. Then, while he waited, he checked the machines and actually found a broken one. As long as he was here, he might as well fix the thing. It gave him something to do and added to the disguise's effect. He tilted his head, letting the long, fake beard fall out of the way of his hands. The beard was one of his favorite prosthetics. Nothing could change the shape of a face faster than a mess of hair, but it did get in the way of close-in, delicate work. In addition to the facial appliances, Fred had caked his face and neck heavily in flesh-colored makeup to hide the aftermath of his near-death experiences on McCovey. Quentin didn't need to see just how deep this thing had gotten. He heard someone enter, heard the tread of feet on the tile floor. Big feet. Excuse me, Quentin said. I need to use the facilities. Fred looked up from the machine. There stood the physical specimen that was Quentin Barnes, quarterback of the Ionath Krakens, all seven feet of him. There was no one with him. Fred had half expected to see Bobby Brobst, Greedock's main bodyguard and hitter, or possibly some work with warriors, but Quentin was alone. The elaborate setup had apparently worked. You surprise me, Quentin said. I thought this Dynolition thing was legit, but you set up the tickets? Frederico shrugged. He had arranged to have the Dynolition commissioner send Quentin four VIP tickets, knowing that Quentin's buddy John, Uncle Johnny the Awesome Tweety, was crazy for the sport. That proved to be incentive enough to bring Quentin, John, and their dates from Ionath to Wilson 6 in the Planetary Union. Rachel Gusford owes me a favor or three, Fred said. I had to contact you while you were away from Ionath. Make sure no one I knew was trying to reach you. Fred recognized the look on Quentin's face. A look of hope. Quentin had hired Fred to find his family. Fred had succeeded but the news wasn't something any 20-year-old orphan really wanted to hear. The look of hope changed to one of concern, of trepidation. Fred, are you okay? I know how much you like to play dress-up and all, but is something wrong? Even through the beard and the other bits of the disguise that made Fred look like a 50-year-old man weighed down by a lifetime of manual labor, Quentin had picked up on Fred's emotions. That was spooky. The kid had a real knack for that, almost like he was a human equivalent of a quith leader. Fred nodded. Yeah, someone doesn't want me to find out about your family. I spent the last few weeks ducking some pretty heavy hitters. Who were they? Greedox gang? Fred shook his head. I wish I knew. I can't say for sure if they're his goons. And they're not the only ones. That little reporter piece of fluff was also on McCovey, digging away. Piece of fluff? You mean Yolanda Davenport? 
Frederico nodded. That's the one. I was at McCovey Stadium, seeing if the Raiders had any info on your past. She was there. Did she see you? A reporter spotting Fred working a case? That would be the day. Quentin, please. I'm a professional. What was she doing on McCovey? Digging into the history of Quentin Barnes, just like me. Just like the heavies I ran into. She find anything? I don't know, Fred said. I don't think she found much. She seemed to be looking for real specific stuff. Stuff about your time with the Raiders, not about your childhood. The hitters, on the other hand, they wanted the same info I found. They always seemed to be just a step behind me. So, you did find something? That look of hope returned, stronger this time. The kid was good at reading emotions and could hide his extremely well, but he was still so young. Most times, those emotions got the better of him, and his face was an open book to his soul. Well, come on, Fred. Out with it. Fred couldn't look into those eager eyes anymore, not with the information he had to deliver. He looked down. Fred hadn't known his own mother, but at least he'd never held on to the hope that she'd been alive, out there somewhere, looking for her baby boy. You sure you want this, Quentin? Are you sure you want to know? Quentin took in a long breath, then let it out slowly. Yes, I want to know. All of it. Fred thought of Quentin as a kid, but he wasn't. Barnes was so big he had to angle his shoulders a little to fit through some doors. He was the starting quarterback of a Tier 1 football team. Quentin was young, sure, but he was man enough to make his own decisions. He had hired Fred to find information, and if Quentin wanted that information... Fred couldn't pretend the man was a child. Okay. I managed to find a family record based on DNA. I used some of your blood. You didn't ask me for my blood. Fred shrugged. You're religious. Who knows what you superstitious primitives think is sacred? I bleed all the time on the field, Fred. You really assume I would think blood is sacred? There's no logic in religion, Quentin. Anyway, if you said no, I would have been out of an option, so I went with it. And where exactly did you get my blood? Nanocyte patch back in INF Stadium. Not hard to come by, Quentin. As you mentioned, you bleed a lot. You knew a guy in McCovey named Sam Sargsian? Ran a barbecue restaurant? Quentin's eyebrows rose. Clearly, he hadn't thought of Sam Sargsian that much lately. Yeah, Quentin said. What's he got to do with it? Nothing. I met him, though. He said you like to eat. A lot. Quentin smiled. I weigh almost 400 pounds, Fred. Of course I eat a lot. You're just stalling. Come on, tell me. Fred sighed. The kid was right. Fred didn't want to give this information and had unintentionally tried to change the subject. You're right. I'm stalling. The Purist Nation records are scattershot at best. Their technology is about 400 years behind everyone else's, but I found the death record for your older brother. Quentin nodded. The news didn't surprise him, because he'd known his brother was dead. The status of all the other family members was a mystery to Quentin, but at just five years old, he'd watched his brother hang for the crime of stealing bread. Turns out your name isn't Barnes, Fred said. At least, not originally. Looks like your family changed names. I'm not sure why. What was it? Carbonaro, Fred said. I found it on your brother's death record. Your brother's death record led me to your mother and father. I could find no official death record of your father. What was my father's name? Killian Carbonaro. That damn expression of hope flared on Quentin's face yet again. Now Quentin had a name. A name made things real. Even without a face to go along with it, a name probably made the poor kid think his father might be out there, somewhere, and not be just another rotted body in a sky-high stack of unknown corpses in Grim Tyrant Valley. That's a start, Quentin said. And my mother? Fred had actually hoped the kid wouldn't ask, but that had been wishful thinking. Her name was Constance Carbonaro. Quentin swallowed. He licked his lips. Fred knew what question was coming. And she's... The kid couldn't even say it. 
Maybe he knew, or at least he suspected it. Time to put those hopes in the ground. She's dead, Quentin. I found her record. It's accurate, no question. I'm sorry. The big man's shoulders sagged. He looked down. In the bathroom of second-rate Smithix Arena in the wastes of Wilson Six, Quentin Barnes had finally learned that his mother was gone. There's more, Frederico said. You told me about your brother, but you said you didn't have any other siblings. Quentin nodded. He kept a straight face, trying to hide his emotions, but Fred didn't need to be a quith leader to see that the kid was devastated. Why did you tell me that? Why didn't you tell me you had a sister? Quentin's eyes snapped up. I... I don't have a sister. Fred felt a wash of excitement, a touch of happiness at bringing some hope back to Quentin's handsome face. There was something about that kid, something that made you want to help him. Well, if the records are accurate, you do. Janine Carbonaro. She's about ten years older than you. She would have been fifteen about the time your brother died. And my... my sister's record? Did you find a death record on her? No, but I found one on your other brother that you probably never knew about. Should Fred tell him? No. Quentin could hide his emotions, but the kid didn't need to know about Quaid Carbonaro just yet. Fred shook his head. Don't get too excited, okay? Just because I didn't find a death record doesn't mean... Doesn't mean that she's alive. I know, Quentin said. I get it, Frederico. You can stop repeating that, okay? Fred nodded. Right. Sorry. It's, it's just, well, you wouldn't be much of a poker player, Quentin. I can see the hope in your face. Quentin's face went instantly blank, like someone had flipped a switch and shut off his emotions. Spooky. With a bit more practice, Quentin would be able to hide any emotion. Damn spooky. We're not playing poker, he said. It's the eyes. A dead giveaway every time. You're not going to start talking about how pretty my eyes are again, are you? Fred smiled and shook his head. No, not at all. He thought back to the first time he'd met Quentin. Fred had donned a pink suit and played the role of an over-the-top effeminate gay man, hoping to expose Quentin as a homophobe, just like the rest of his purest nation countrymen. Fred had done that because he wanted a reason to turn down Quentin's business, a reason to ignore the kind of money that a Tier 1 quarterback could pay. The act had disturbed Quentin, sure, but the kid had owned up to the fact that a gay man made him uncomfortable, owned up to it, and immediately tried to deal with it. What's more, he'd been transparent about that, honest about it. Fred had never expected such behavior from a 19-year-old nationalite. To tell you the truth, Fred said, when we first met, I did that just to get a rise out of you. You're okay looking by the numbers, but you're not really my type. I wish I could say I was offended by that. The roar of the crowd made them both look at the door. Fred nodded. You need to get back to your date. If you want, I'll keep looking for more info. I do, Quentin said. Just find whatever you can, even... Even death records give me some idea, you know? Fred nodded, then turned his attention back to the broken nanite machine. It would take another 30 minutes or so to fix it. Then, he'd catch his flight to Jupiter. Red Storm City awaited, and, hopefully, so did Janine. Book 4. Jupiter. Chapter 18. Rico. Sometimes Fred wore the disguises. Sometimes the disguises seemed to wear him, to consume him, to push his actual self down so far that it was a little hard to remember what was real. That had happened with the Caleb persona. It had happened with a few other disguises as well, but there was one disguise that took him over so completely he didn't want to come out of it. He didn't want to come out of it because it wasn't really a disguise at all. It was a younger version of himself. Rico walked down the streets of Red Storm City. 
He'd docked several hours ago, when he'd been Fred, not Rico, but something was nagging at the back of Fred's thoughts. That note. Actual paper. Aged paper. It had seemed so convincing. A little detail, something that made things seem real. No, not convincing. It seemed romantic. Not in the kissing sense, the relationship sense, but the bigger sense of the word. Romanticism, a grand sweeping story that seemed larger than life. At first, the paper had sold him, but the trip from McCovey to Jupiter gave Fred time to think. The paper. It was too romantic. It made Fred wonder if Carney was the aw shucks minor he seemed to be. Maybe someone had got to him. Maybe this trip to Jupiter was a setup. Maybe someone wanted to kill Fred, and this trip would be his last. That's why Fred stepped onto the transport at McCovey, but Rico walked through the streets of Red Storm City. His first stop had been to a human clothing store. What he found wasn't an actual flight jacket, but it was close enough. The smell of leather. That helped him slide further into his past, as did the goatee and the sunglasses. When he looked at himself in the mirror, he realized that Fred was the disguise. This was the real person. The things Rico had lived through. Well, that was because Rico couldn't be killed. Rico's second stop took more time. He let his instincts take him to the right area, almost like he could smell the thing he needed. He tried a convenience store then a gambling parlor, then a brothel before he found what he needed in the offices of an unlicensed doctor. He paid four times what it was worth, not that it mattered. It wasn't his money, after all. When he put the spun steel composite revolver in his pocket, Rico felt better. Five shots, no bigger than his hand, but it would blow the back of a man's head wide open. Newly armed, he moved on to his third stop, Rico rarely drank on the job, and it was his policy never to get drunk while on a mission. Yet he couldn't deny he was starting to tip slightly the wrong way as he downed his fifth shot of the night. It was frustration more than anything else. He'd walked into half-timers at an hour that apparently marked a shift change in Red Storm City's manufacturing district. The place was packed with loud, working-class sentience, mostly human, mostly wearing one kind of Jupiter Jacks paraphernalia or another. Some of the gold, silver, and copper shirts, hats, and coats were beat up, marked with dirt and grease, and looked like they'd spent decades conforming to the bodies of their owners. There were other teams represented as well. The Red Lightning of the Hurrah Airspace League, Stormcloud FC, and an occasional shirt that supported one of the Dynalition teams. Rico didn't mind the crowd. In fact, that's what he'd wanted. He needed as many employees on duty as possible so he could search for Janine, and he wanted to be able to hide in the crowd while he did it. Rico found a corner that gave him a view of most of the bar. He started drinking because he had to drink something. Few bars have patience for non-drinking customers, and if he sat there for hours sipping a soft drink, that would arouse suspicion. A quiet man drinking alone in a bar didn't attract attention, nor had it for several centuries. By the end of the third hour, Rico was convinced Carney had sent him on a wild goose chase. Rico had struck out with every single server, bartender, and cook in the place. Not only was Janine not among them, no one had ever heard of her. No one could place the name, the description, or the backstory Rico laid out. Even if she'd given false information, something should have stuck with someone, even a tiny detail. Still, nothing. Rico knew Fred had been a fool. Fred was hopeful. Fred was optimistic. Fred thought people were good. Rico knew better. He knew that people were garbage, and everyone was either out to get you or to take something from you. A total waste of time and money. Rico knew that maybe he hadn't been needed after all. Maybe it was time to put on the Fred disguise again. Let Fred handle things from here on out. And then Rico saw him. At the end of the bar, out of the glaring lights, looking inconspicuous despite being so big, 
sat a human. Bobby Brobst, Greedock's main hitter. Bobby Brobst, who had a flexi cast on his right pinky. And just like that, Rico knew. It had been Brobst in the records room on McCovey. Brobst had been the one who nearly choked Fred to death. Rico took him in. Brobst's build and heavy brow bordered just north of heavy G country. He looked like a perfect thug in that way, a classic leg breaker. But his eyes were sharp, calculating. That made sense. The human who tried to put Fred away back in the records room had been more than strong and fast. He was cagey. Rico didn't flinch. He didn't stare. He didn't change his behavior in any way. Bobby was looking around. Bobby was supposed to make that as transparent as Rico made it, but Bobby wasn't as good at the game as Rico was. Most everyone didn't realize Bobby was there, but to a pro, the big man stood out like a face with two noses. It was no coincidence that Brobst was here, in Red Storm City above Jupiter, sitting in the same bar where Carney had told Fred to come and find Jeanine. That changed everything. It brought the last few weeks of Fred's life into sharp focus. Rico knew it meant that his Fred disguise was no longer flying under anyone's radar. Fred had suspected Greedock might be responsible for the Quith Warriors in the desert, and Fred had been right. There was no Janine to be found here. Only death. Bropes looked Rico's way. For a moment, their eyes met, then Bropes kept scanning, kept looking. He didn't recognize me. Rico waited until Brobst turned to scan the other side of the room, then quietly stood and walked to the door, using his skill at moving without drawing attention, without bumping into anyone or making sudden moves that would catch a hunting eye. He didn't bother trying to scope out individuals who might be ghosting his movements. Everyone in this place might as well have been an agent for the Splithead. Once outside, Rico kept walking, kept looking. On the other side of the curved radius road, he saw a pair of quith warriors sitting in a grav cab. They were watching half-timers. And above, a Kretorakian civilian circling in a non-random pattern. Extra muscle and eyes in the sky. Brobst hadn't come alone. Rico never slowed, never sped up, just kept moving at the same pace. He crossed the street. He looked for and found another bar, one with windows that looked out onto the street that gave a view of half-timers. He gave a drunken quith worker a hundred-credit chip to leave a table next to the window. Rico sat. Rico watched. Rico waited. Now, marginally safe from the trap, Rico relaxed. His work was done. As he relaxed, he faded away, allowing Fred to come to the surface again. Fred watched. Fred waited. It had been Greedock the whole time. It was Greedock's warriors in Raider Stadium, and in the desert, trying to blow him up. Gooley was working for Greedock. Greedock wanted the same information on Barnes that Fred had been hired to chase down. Why? That was the question Fred asked himself over and over, as he waited and watched from across the street. One hour became two, and then Fred's patience paid off. Bobby Brobst walked out of the club alone. He nodded to the thugs in the grav cab. They drove off. Brobst didn't climb into a private car. Instead, he headed up the street away from the club. Brobst was dangerous, sure, but he was also making mistakes. A guy that big could delude himself into thinking he was a better player than he actually was. Brobst shouldn't have been alone, and Fred wasn't going to let that mistake go unpunished. Fred shadowed Brobst from a comfortable distance for a few blocks before snaking across the street. City night had fallen, the dome protecting Red Storm City darkening, casting the street in shadow. Brobst walked into a dingy hotel. Fred waited a few minutes, then followed him in. From there, it was a scene Fred had played out a dozen times before. Quietly give the hotel clerk a chunk of change, in this case, 500 credits, to get Brobst's room number. Brobst had been at that bar for hours. He hadn't eaten. He hadn't stopped for food on the way from the bar to the hotel. 
Fred used the stairwell to go to Brope's floor, then waited for room service to show. When the waiter came, another 500 credits meant Fred got to deliver it. Fred waited until the waiter left the hallway, then he knocked. Bobby Brobst opened the door, expecting to see his food. Instead, he was looking down the barrel of a small revolver. Hi, Bobby, Fred said. We need to talk. Fred poured two glasses of vodka. The first one he rose in a silent toast to his new friend, then knocked it back. The second glass he held to the lips of Bobby Brobst. Bob couldn't drink it by himself because his hands were tied to the arms of a metal desk chair. So were his ankles. So was his waist. Hey, he was a big guy, and Fred didn't want to give him any room to maneuver. Bobby was no dummy. He knew this might be his last taste ever, so he drank. Thanks, he said. My pleasure. My ass is getting tired from sitting here, Bobby said. You got me all tied up, so it's your show, but can we get this over with? What if I'm going to kill you? Do you still want to get it over with? Bobby swallowed. He licked his lips. Like I said, my ass is getting tired, so whatever you're going to do, do it. Fred sat on the bed. He casually pointed his gun at Bobby's chest. Sure, Fred said. Let's do it. What does Greedock want with Quentin Barnes's family history? Bobby just shook his head. Fred stood. He pressed the muzzle of the pistol against Brope's temple. Bobby still didn't look scared, but it was clear he didn't like having that kind of tech so close to his face. I don't think you'll do it, Bobby said. Killing me doesn't gain you anything. I've been studying you, Gonzaga. You're in it for the money. You're smart enough to know that if you kill me, more people are coming after you. People even besides Greedock. Maybe even my brother. Do you have a brother? Do you really want to find out? Fred smiled. That's good. You're smarter than you look, Bobby. But what if I don't kill you? What if I just beat the hell out of you until I get what I want? Bobby licked his lips again. He sighed. I'm no fan of pain, but I'm trained to manage it. I don't think you've got what it takes to go far enough to get anything out of me. Fred's eyes became as hard as the metal chair. Are you sure about all of that, Bobby? There might have been a sliver of doubt in Bobby's eyes, but he didn't break. He just sat there in silence, staring back. Fred took one more shot. How did he rig the phony letter from Quentin's sister? Brobe still didn't answer, but for just a split second there was a twitch in his brow, as if his eyes were about to narrow. It was gone just as quickly, but Fred recognized the micro-expression. He realized it was confusion. Brobst didn't know about the letter. He hadn't been involved in that part of it. You were here to kill me, Fred said. Greedock told you where I'd be, and you were to take me out, right? Bobby looked at the floor. He knew his next words might spell his end, but he nodded. Yeah, he said. That's right. Fred took the muzzle away from the skull. It was a hard reminder that had things gone slightly different, had Fred come as himself instead of letting Rico take over, Fred could be the one in that chair or already be dead. How long you been waiting for me? Six days, Bobby said. I was cleared to wait another four. Carney. They had used Carney to get Fred to Jupiter. They just hadn't known exactly when Fred would arrive. You're right, Bobby. I'm not a murderer, strictly speaking. And torture isn't my bag. But none of that is going to be necessary. You've been a big help. Brobst frowned. Even if you don't kill me, this is damn embarrassing. You owe me, Fred said. You know I could waste you right now. I'm not going to do that. So you owe me. Bobby looked up. You're assuming that even if I agree, my word is worth something. Fred shrugged. Hope springs eternal. Only time will tell. Throw in another platitude if you like, but maybe we'll never find out. Oh, and you're not getting away completely scot-free, big fella. Fred whipped the pistol in a sideways arc, slamming the butt into Bobby's temple. 
Bobby's head rocked back. He stiffened, then sagged, unconscious. Fred taped Bobby's mouth shut. He left the man strapped to the chair, grabbed his bag, thumbed the Do Not Disturb icon, and pulled the door shut. Bobby would be there a day, two at the most, before someone came in to clean the room for the next guest. By then, Fred would be on his way to McCovey. Fred would have the rest of the day, and maybe the next, before any message from Bobby could reach McCovey. Hopefully, that was all the time Fred needed to find Carney, get some answers, then get the hell off that piece of crap mining colony before Greedock sent more trouble. Book 5. McCovey. Chapter 19. Stedmar. This time, Fred opted for more expensive digs. He'd done the low-rent hotels in McCovey and stayed out of sight, but to use another low-rent facility would be to create a pattern. In his line of work, patterns were bad. So, just for the sake of the job, mind you, he picked a four-star place to clean up and gather his thoughts before he went after Carney. Four-star facilities meant nanite showers. Most McCovians wanted cleaning facilities that used real water. Just another indicator of how primitive this culture could be. Fred stood in the nanite stall, raising his arms, turning his body this way and that, to let the tiny machines work every area of his skin and scalp. He even opened his mouth, letting them swarm on his tongue, his teeth, his gums, and the inside of his cheeks. In an hour, maybe less, he'd go to the mines and see if Carney was still there. Hopefully, the man would be. Tracking someone down in McCovey wasn't impossible, but it wasn't much fun, and Fred wanted to be done with his business before any message from Bobby Brobst could arrive via punch drive relays. But what was Carney's game? Why had such a nice kid sent Fred to his possible death? Odds were Carney had no idea of what was going on. Greedock must have gotten to him. If not Greedock, then Stedmar Osborne, crime lord of McCovey, and Greedock's underling. Maybe they put pressure on Carney to betray Fred. Maybe they'd offered the kid a ton of money to deliver the note and the story. Fred couldn't blame Carn if that was the case. Greedock's pocket change was likely more than Carney could make in a decade. The nanite bin let out a beep. Fred was as scrubbed as scrubbed could be. The fog of tiny machines filtered back into the bin, leaving Fred naked and spotless. He stepped out of the stall and into the bathroom. What disguise would he use this time? An old man? Maybe a woman? He'd give that some thought, but first he needed to eat. Once he went after Carney, there was no telling if he'd have time to stop for a bite. Fred opened the bathroom door, then stared, stunned. Hey, Mr. Gonzaga, how you doing? The two human men standing outside the bathroom filled Fred with the urge to slam the door, dive for cover, and grab the nearest weapon. He didn't do any of those things, of course. That was just his fight-or-flight instinct being triggered. The men were huge. They wore tailored suits that probably had weapons hidden inside the jackets. He was naked. If they'd wanted him dead, they would have come in and killed him. They wanted to talk. If he attacked them, that could change quite quickly. His false identity hadn't drawn any suspicion at the McCovey shuttle port. He hadn't used that identity before, at least not on McCovey. How had they found him? And who were they? What worried him most of all, though, was their demeanor. These guys were gangland thugs. They knew how to fight. Two-on-one, unarmed, Fred didn't stand a chance. Hi, Fred said. If you guys are waiting to take a dump, I'm all done in there. The one on the right smiled. He had white-pink skin, black hair, and a neck that was as thick as Fred's waist. The one on the left didn't smile. He had black skin, deep black, with tight, curly black hair that looked coated with oil. His right eye was a sheen of wet steel. My name is Frankie, said the man on the right. He nodded at the other one. This is Sammy. The names made Fred realize just how much trouble he was in. Frankie and Sammy, Fred said. 
Where's Dean? Busy, Frankie said. Very busy. Mr. Osborne would like a word with you. Frankie, Sammy, and Dean, the three primary bodyguards slash hitters slash knuckle breakers of one Stedmar Osborne. No neck Frankie was obviously the talker of the two. Sammy's one good eye looked out with the blank stare of a sociopath. You should get dressed, Frankie said. You guys gonna watch? Usually people like to see me take it all off, not put it all on. Frankie smiled. I've heard that you always got something funny to say, and here I am, so well known for my ability to listen to other people's jokes. Somehow, Fred doubted that. Sammy crossed his huge arms over his chest. If you don't want to get dressed, I can bring you in just like that. Fred held up a hand. No, that, that's okay. I'll just throw on a little something. Frankie gestured to the bedroom where Fred's clothes were. Quicker is better than slower. Fred walked into the bedroom and started to get dressed. Both men stood in the doorway, watching. That didn't mean they were perverts. It meant they were professionals. If they'd left Fred alone, he could have found a way out or found a stashed weapon. If just one watched him, there was a chance Fred could try his luck, hoping to take that one out and even the odds. But both of them together, it kept things calm and predictable. Fred held up a black T-shirt. Should I wear black? If I'm not coming back from this meeting, I might as well look the part. Frankie shrugged. That's not up to me. But you seem like you've been around, Mr. Gonzaga. If Mr. Osborne wanted you in the ground, you'd already be there. Sammy nodded. Fred dressed. How had they found him? Had Greedock somehow got word to his lieutenant? If Bobby had gotten out quick, his message would still be routing through the various punch space relays. Whatever the reason, whatever the plan, Frankie and Sammy had him now. All Fred could do was play it out. Osborne's office was almost tasteful, but the man obviously enjoyed opulence. Fred spotted items that must have been imported from over a dozen systems at great cost. The limo ride over had been uneventful. Fred found himself wanting to question Frankie about his background, but he didn't. Mostly because Sammy sat beside him the whole way, never taking his eye off Fred. He couldn't decide the cycloptic killer was merely being vigilant or if he was actively hoping for an excuse to break Fred's neck. When they led Fred through ornate double doors, he found Stedmar sitting behind a slab of a desk. Another gigantic man in a suit stood behind him. Dean, most likely. Osborne had the poker face of a consummate businessman. Fred imagined he was a hell of a negotiator. He cause any trouble? Osborne said to Frankie. No, Mr. Osborne, Frankie said. He seems like a smart one. Good, Stedmar said. Smart, I like. Saves time. Frankie ushered Fred into one of the guest chairs on the opposite side of Osborne's desk. Fred settled in. He found his fear had subsided, replaced by a deep curiosity about where all of this was going. Meanwhile, Frankie and Sammy took up positions behind him, flanking him closely. Osborne leaned forward, elbows on his desk. You want a drink? A drink? Well, this was downright hospitable. Scotch. Neat. Dean, get the man a scotch, Osborne said. No ice. And get me a limoncello, will you? Dean nodded and walked over to the bar, where he set about using his thick, scarred hands to fix the drinks. Frankie and Sammy remained stationed behind Fred. You haven't asked who I am, so I assume you know, Osborne said. Fred nodded. He took in the infinity symbol tattooed on Osborne's forehead. That meant the man was a confirmed member of the purest church, yet he wore a suit instead of blue robes. Although Fred was sure the man was more interested in how that status could aid his criminal enterprise, the symbol still filled Fred with a blind and familiar rage. Dean brought the drinks. Fred resisted the urge to down his in one gulp. Instead, he sipped, casually. Stedmar sipped his own drink and studied Fred. You know, I can't tell if you're scared out of your mind or if you're as diamond-hard as I've heard. Fred offered him nothing. Osborne looked above Fred's right shoulder. What do you think, Frankie? 
That doesn't mean as much as most people think, said Frankie from behind Fred's back. We could find out, said Sammy. I volunteer. Osborne nodded, as if to say, that could still be on the agenda. He set his drink down. Not just yet, he said. He folded his hands atop his desk. His eyes bore into Fred. You broke into my stadium, he said. You stole from me. That much I know. We've also got a dead city worker and two charred quith warriors out in the dunes. Now, a dead citizen is bad enough, but two alien corpses on Makovi, on purest nation soil, where no member of the satanic races are ever supposed to set foot? Do you have a single shucking clue how much heat I'm going to take from the holy men? And the bats, they're doing flybys outside my damn window every hour on the hour. Fred did his best to stay still, to not show any emotion. Stedmar had tracked him down because of the stadium? Maybe he didn't know about Bobby Brobst. If he didn't, how long until he did? How long until a message from Greedock arrived on Makovi? A message that said, Kill Frederico Esteban Gasipi Gonzaga the moment you see him. What that really meant, though, was that Fred had a chance. If he could finish up here and get back on the streets before any such message arrived, he could live. Stedmar was obviously no dummy. When dealing with a smart man, don't try to talk him out of what he already knows. That's all true, Fred said. I admit it. To his surprise, Osborne laughed. <laughs> I think you're right, Frankie. He is hard. Osborne handed Dean his empty glass, and the hulking, dim-looking thug took it back to the bar for a refill. You know, Fred, uh, may I call you Fred? Osborne didn't wait for a response before speaking on. Fred, the only reason I haven't had my boys ventilate your skull is because Frankie there seems to think you haven't really done anything to hurt or insult me. Uh, nothing that you can't buy your way out of, I mean, and that you might have information that's of use to me. Those quith you torched in the old shipyard? Not mine. That means someone else is working my territory, and I want to know who it is. If you can tell me that, maybe it's worth your life. Maybe. Tell me what you're doing in my mining colony, Fred. Fred's expression didn't change, didn't even waver, but Stedmar's words changed the game. The man was part of Greedock's syndicate. He was a high-ranking player, as far as Fred knew. If Greedock wanted to get at Fred while he was on McCovey, Osborne was the logical choice to tap for that job. But he hadn't tapped Stedmar. Why? Why send non-human hitters to McCovey instead of using Frankie and Sammy and Dean? There was only one conclusion to draw. Greedock didn't want his human lieutenant to know about the operation or its nature. He didn't want Osborne to gain access to the information on Quentin Barnes that was at the heart of this thing. Whether that was because Greedock simply didn't trust Osborne, or whether it had to do with Barnes specifically, Fred couldn't know. But it might be the only chip he had to play. I'm a private investigator, Fred began carefully, still going over all the angles in his head. I'm here on behalf of a client. The nature of the job is confidential, but I can assure you what I'm looking for has nothing to do with you or your business. Osborne frowned. Do you like baseball? Excuse me? Baseball, Osborne said. That old earth sport. What was the man getting at? I'm familiar with it, but not really a fan. So you know how the game works? Fred nodded. Good, Osborne said, because that's strike one. I asked you a question you didn't answer. If it goes down to McCovey, it involves my business. You crapped all over my house. No one dies on McCovey without my permission. Fred thought of mentioning these stacks of corpses in Grim Tyrant Valley, but that probably wasn't a good idea. I'm sorry about that, Mr. Osborne. Piss on your sorry. Strike one. You do not want to reach strike three. But those bodies aren't on me, Fred said. They were trying to kill me. I just defended myself. Osborne held up two fingers. And there's your second strike. For the last time, Fred, if those bodies aren't on you, who do I put them on? Osborne was forcing the issue. Fred had to take his shot. 
One way or another, Fred's next words were the checkmate. If the apparent rift between Osborne and Greedock wasn't what he hoped, then Fred was about to give Osborne all the reason he needed to cut Fred's head off and mail it special delivery to the owner of the bootleg arms. It was Fred's turn to lean forward and dead-eye Stedmore Osborne as he said, Greedock, the Splithead. Osborne thought on that for a long time. Those were Greedock's guys out in the dunes? Fred nodded. You're a liar. Of course I am, Fred said. That's my job, to lie. But this is the truth. Who else has the juice and the balls, uh, metaphorically speaking, of course, to land Quith Warriors armed to the teeth on your purest nation paradise right under your nose and without asking permission? Osborne's next question was inevitable, and it would determine whether divulging Greedock's involvement saved Fred's life or ended it. All right, Fred. Why? He and I are both looking for the same thing. What does Greedock want? What are you after? I can't tell you that. It's privileged information. Osborne didn't say a word. He didn't give any visible signal. But in the next moment, Fred's right ear was numb, the space between his temples was burning, and blood began to seep into his vision. He also found, much to his surprise, he was now lying on the floor and couldn't quite remember how he'd come to be there. Then he looked up and saw Sammy standing above him. He was holding a pistol in his hand, the butt of which contained Fred's blood and several strands of his hair. Fred hadn't been aware of Sammy drawing the weapon, nor had he sensed the blow coming. Through the pain and disorientation, Fred was glad he hadn't taken on Frankie and Sammy back at the hotel. I want to know what Greedock wants with your client, Osborne demanded from somewhere that seemed very far away. Fred tried to get to his hands and knees, but found that task required more coordination than he currently possessed. He let himself sag back down. It's my client's business, he said with as much finality as he could project while bleeding on someone's floor. It isn't yours or that furry butcher's. It's all I can tell you. Two sets of hands lifted Fred up like he was no more than a toddler, then set him hard back in the chair. Osborne looked at Frankie. He seemed to be asking the man a question without speaking. Frankie stared down at Fred. Again, that thoughtful shrug. Sammy could probably get it out of him, but by the time we broke him down enough to spill it, his brain would be jelly. Counterproductive. Diamond hard? Osborne asked Frankie. Diamond hard, Frankie confirmed. Osborne leaned back in his chair. He reached into a desk drawer and pulled out a white handkerchief, which he tossed to Fred. Fred wondered how many handkerchiefs Osborne had in that drawer. Fred pressed the fabric to his wounded scalp. Osborne scratched his nose. He stared. Well, Fred, if I can't have whatever this hot item is, then I guess you're the only currency I got. Greedock seems to want you pretty bad. And you can give me to him, if helping to make him even more powerful is what you want. Osborne's eyes grew deadly again. What's that supposed to mean? I don't know. Why didn't he tap you to begin with? Why didn't we have this conversation the last time I was on McCovey? Osborne didn't answer that, but he didn't get angry and have Fred bashed on the other ear either. Instead, he turned his gaze from Fred. There was an image floating on Osborne's desk. It was a woman, beautiful and blonde, and a small child. The child was unmistakably Osborne's progeny. Fred could see it in the eyes. That made the woman his wife, or at least the mother of his child, and since she was in the image, she meant something to him. Osborne took a drink, staring at the image of his family longer than he probably realized. When he spoke again, it was much more reserved than before. The bravado was gone. His anger at Fred and his thirst for any edge had dulled. That still doesn't give me a reason why I shouldn't seal you in an airtight container and ship your ass to my shamacath as tribute. Uh, for starters, because of how bitter that word shamacath seems to taste in your mouth. Osborne looked at the image of his family again. Emotion is the enemy of business, he said, more to himself than to Fred. Maybe, but it can be part of a strategy. Yours or mine? The words gave Fred a new respect for the man's mind. Osborne wasn't going to let Fred play him, 
but he was listening. Delivering me won't have the upside you think. If you bring me in, Greedock has to wonder what I told you. Maybe things he didn't want you to know. You put yourself on his radar as a possible liability. On the other hand, you're not under any obligation to handle this. He didn't charge you with it. If I close my case, the heat doesn't fall on you, but it does weaken Greedock. It won't cripple him, but anything that hurts him only makes those in competition with him stronger. So you're saying I got no downside here? Either you take a bite out of the split head, or you die and none of it blows back on me? Basically. I wish I was in your shoes. Lately, I've had nothing but downside. And you want to change that? Fred nodded. Yes, I need your permission for that, and for one more thing. Osborne deliberated in silence for less than sixty seconds, but Fred felt every single one tick by. With each moment, he was stealing himself for a last, desperate stand if this didn't go his way. He would go for Sammy first, drive an elbow into his Adam's apple, and get his gun, take Frankie out next. If he dropped them, he'd have to take out Dean before the big man could draw. Fred knew it wouldn't work, but if he was going to die, he would die fighting, not begging. My permission, Stedmar said. And what's the one more thing? I need to go after someone who works for Greedock. Stedmar nodded. Uh-huh. Who? Name is Carney. He works in the mines. Stedmar looked at Frankie. We know a Carney? No, Mr. Osborne, Frankie said. He doesn't work for me. And since my Shamacath didn't tell me about him, I don't know anything about the guy. That means he's not under my protection. Osborne stood. I don't care what happens to this Carney as long as it doesn't point back to me. I'll give you a 24-hour pass, Gonzaga. After that, I want you off McCovey, and you don't ever come back. Not ever. You had a fancy fake identity, and I found you this time, didn't I? Fred nodded. And how did you do that? Osborne smiled. Wouldn't you like to know? What matters is, I found you this time. I'll find you again. Well, can I at least ask if anyone else knows I'm here? I mean, did I screw up and all of McCovey knows I'm back in town? Or is this some talent that's specific to your organization? Then Osborne made a mistake. He turned and looked at Dean. Dumb-looking Dean was the one who'd known Fred had returned. Fred didn't know how, but that was good information to have for the future. Dean shook his head. No one knows, Mr. Osborne. Osborne turned back to Fred. Twenty-four hours, Gonzaga. You're not gone. Your costumes won't matter. I'll put you in a hole so deep, they won't turn you up if they strip mine this place for the next thousand years. Fred nodded. Every muscle relaxed, and he found even the pain in his head lessened. Osborne motioned to the door with his glass. The meeting was over. Chapter 20. Raphael. The axe handled tastes briefly of oak and dirt, and something that might be rotten. After the blow, it comes away streaked with blood and carrying two of Rico's teeth, now embedded in the wood. The teeth sparkle wetly, pink-white boats in a sea of scratched wood grain. He tastes his own blood, coppery and viscous, pooling around his tongue, until he vomits what feels like a half-pint of the stuff. Fingers as hard and strong as railroad spikes curl into a fist with his hair caught vice-like between them. They pry his head back. The light from the bonfire bathes his blood-streaked face. You watch this, Rico! The voice belongs to Sarnoff, Rico's lieutenant. Sarnoff's other hand is holding the slightly curved end of the axe handle that just broke Rico's jaw. Dennison is sitting on Rico's outstretched legs, while Zhang and Fletcher hold his arms. Rico can't even struggle against them. The rest of the guys from his squad stand in the background, many hoping the darkness beyond the firelight will hide the guilt and pain and doubt written all over their battle-hardened faces. 
You ain't come back here in a long, long time, Cher, the Lois says. It sits gingerly on the thick end of Sarnoff's axe handle, lounging in Rico's blood. In the distance, the bishop strikes Raphael in much the same way Sarnoff just bashed Rico. The bishop, however, is wielding his ornate staff crowned with a steel infinity symbol. And while Rico is at the edge of a forest of blue-green trees, each engulfed with pale orange creepers, Raphael is in a clearing, a clearing surrounded by a cheering crowd of hundreds. Raphael is standing on a pile of wood. He is tied to a stake that sticks up from that pile like the mast of a ship without sails. Raph is terrified. It's all over his face. He was a crappy poker player. He couldn't hide his emotions. His expressive face was one of the first things that Rico noticed. The staff strikes home again. The infinity symbol cuts Raph's forehead, opening up a geyser of red above his right eye. Absurdly, insanely, Rico hopes they haven't damaged Raph's hands. Raph's emotions run deep. Things that most people don't notice affect him in a spiritual way. You wouldn't think a kind soul like that belonged in a fighter's body, but Raph has crazy coordination and fast hands. He was the division champ at his weight, a real prospect to go pro in the octagon. But Rico knows that will never happen. Raph will never fight again. Raph will never make it off of that pile of dry wood. Look at him, Sarnoff says. You'd be down there with him if you weren't one of us, boy. You don't cure this disease of yours, and next time it will be you down there. We saved you, but this happens again, and we'll watch you burn. He don't know, does he? The Loa asks. It reaches out and pulls one of Fred's teeth from the axe handle, examining it like a curio from ancient Victorian times. He don't know the only thing you want in all the world, across all them stars, is to be down there and burn right alongside Raphael. You don't want to be saved, do you, Cher? Rico didn't. He watches as women wearing blue robes light torches. They walk around the pile of wood, sticking the torches in among the tinder, waiting only long enough to see the orange flames spring to life before moving on to the next spot. Rico knows Raph is going to die. Rico wants to die with him. But you didn't die, the lower reminds him. I think after all this time, you'd learn to be glad for that, at least. Glowing patches spread and expand until they join, until the entire pile crackles with the low one's touch, and at the center of it all, Raphael, the firelight reflecting off the blood that sheets his face. Why you want to see this now, boy? The Loa sounds more frustrated than anything. This is the one where it all started. The flames reach Raph. Fred watches his face contort in a scream, but the sound is drowned out by the righteous cheers of the onlookers. Rico begins to struggle anew. It's futile, even pathetic. But it doesn't stop Sarnoff from jabbing him brutally with the end of the axe handle to still him. Ain't nothing good about to come from this here boy. I thought we was past this. A part of Rico will never really leave this moment. If he should live to be an old man and die in his bed surrounded by fifty children and grandchildren a million light years from where this happened, the real Frederico Esteban Giuseppe Gonzaga, the man that Rico was born to be before this hated religion took everything away, that Rico will still be trapped in this moment. The moment when his real self died alongside the love of his life. The accelerant they doused Raph's body with turns him into a human fireball. His perfect olive skin blisters bright red, then turns black. His scream becomes a silent, grotesque mask burned into his face. Something breaks, or burns, or cracks, and Raph's hand, his right hand, comes free. Skin replaced by flickering flame, the hand reaches out, clutching, grasping. The hand reaches toward Rico. 
in that moment. Rico knows it's a reactive thing. Raphael doesn't know he's there, but in Rico's heart, a different truth hits hard and lodges forever. The truth that Raph is reaching out to him, reaching out and thinking, why didn't you save me? You said you love me, that we would always protect each other. Why did you let them kill me? For the first time in years, Fred woke up screaming. He was dripping with sweat. His sheets were soaked clean through. In a moment of sheer, disoriented panic, he snatched up the entropic pistol from his nightstand and brought it to bear on every dark corner and crevice of his bedroom. He aimed it everywhere, over and over again, making sure that the holy men, the Loa, Sarnoff, even the flaming Raph hadn't come back with him to invade this lonely reality. The mania subsided, faded away like a splash of water soaking into dry silicon. Fred climbed out of bed. He wandered through his apartment in a half daze, holding the pistol loosely at his side. Eventually, he came to stand at his living room window. It was night, but the street below was still choked with activity. It was good to think a lot of those sentients couldn't sleep either. In an absurd way, it made Fred feel more normal. It made the nightmare, uncontrollable and inescapable as it was, seem to matter a little less. Still, he never went back to sleep that night. He didn't even try. Chapter 21 Carney Fred stood on the narrow catwalk outside of Carney's shack for the better part of the evening. He kept to the shadows, ever vigilant, turning events over and over in his head. Carney emerged past midnight, lugging a large rucksack. It must have been heavy. The strap was dragging his shoulder low. Fred stepped out of the shadows a few yards in front of him. Drop the bag, Carn. Carney squinted in his usual slow-on-the-uptake way. Caleb, what are you doing? Drop it. The bag and the act. Carney lowered the rucksack to the deck. Fred approached him slowly. That looks heavy. You going hiking or something? Or something. Carney still looked confused. Fred could see through it now, but even so, the guy had serious skills. Caleb, are you okay? I never thought I'd see you again. Is that who I am, Carn? Is that my name, Caleb Cole? The confused look remained for a second more. Then, Carney knew. He knew that Fred was on to him, and there would be no finessing his way out of it. His face changed so drastically that Fred wanted to reach for a weapon right then. The young guy he'd known as Carney, earnest and sincere, and yearning for some kind of connection, that guy evaporated. What filled the complete void left in its wake was something dark. It was an absence of not only identity, but humanity. Fred's suspicion was confirmed. Carney wasn't just a dupe or a patsy or a plant. He was a professional. I'm not Caleb, and you're not Carney, Fred said. So who are you? What difference does it make? I'm the bad guy. But good at what you do. Better than me. Maybe the best I've ever seen. Carney laughed a little, but there was nothing mirthful about it. That's high praise. It's the truth. I never questioned you for a second. Everything was right. Every little emotion, every little tick. It all said, I'm an abandoned puppy, loyal and friendly and just looking for a home. And I ate it right up. The player got played. Fred could only nod. He was still reeling from this revelation, and he found himself having trouble controlling his reactions. He'd not only been fooled by the act, he'd liked Carney. Liked him in a way he hadn't liked someone in a long time. And it had been fake. All of it. I'm guessing it was a good thing I never let you into my shack. If I had, would I have lived to see the morning? No, Carney said with a terrifying grin. But you would have died happy. I wasn't lying about that part. 
Why not just take me out in the mines? Or any of the dozens of times we hung out after the whistle blew? Carney shook his head, slowly, in a way that said, That's not the way I work. I'm careful, Caleb, and precise, like you. Besides, you're a hard man to kill. Hitters from every race been trying to rub you out every which way for weeks. Pulse cannons, poisons, high-speed chases, and you're still here. Nope. The minute I saw you in the flesh, I knew the only weapon that could kill you is trust. But I could never find a big enough caliber. You wouldn't let me in. Yeah, I have a real problem with that. It saved your life. And that letter? Once you left the mines, the people I work for got nervous. They needed to get you in a controlled environment. They needed you to take everything you'd gathered back home or to Jupiter, and then they needed a window to snatch it. And I gave them both. And all I had to do was write a note and age a little old piece of paper. Fred nodded. He wanted to beat this man to death. He also wanted the character of Carney to be real, to come to life and push out this manipulating chameleon. Fred wanted his Carney back. Being on the other end of a con job is an awful thing. Like I said, Carn, you're the best I've ever seen. And you're good enough to figure it out. So we're both quite impressed with each other. That's grand and wonderful. What about the girl? Does she exist? Do you know where she is? Carney only grinned his maniacal grin. He would never give that information up, Fred realized. He also realized Carney didn't feel caught or trapped. He had every intention of getting through Fred and completing this assignment. They both stood there on the catwalk for a moment, neither taking any action, both sizing up the other man and his intention. Finally. Carney asked, So what happens now? That depends. If I let you go, can you walk away? You get off McCovey, leave this job, and never get in my way again? There are very few acts of which I'm not capable, Fred. Walking away from a job is on that list, however. Are you any different? No. Then I repeat, what happens now? Fred had been fooled. He knew that. He had a need to find something good in people. His heart had led him astray, but his eyes operated in a different way. He'd seen Carney palm a blade when the rucksack hit the thin catwalk deck. The trick wasn't just seeing that delicate, expertly done maneuver. It was not showing that it had been seen. Fred stepped in. Carney reached up his empty hand with incredible speed, attempting to brush Fred's head to one side. The move was intended to have two effects, distract Fred and expose his neck. Neither thing happened. Fred grabbed Carney's extended wrist, even as he yanked his own blade from its sheath. Carney twisted his hand free and recovered instantly. They both struck at the exact same moment. Carney went high, while Fred went low. Carney's blade came for Fred's neck, aiming for where Fred's neck would have been if Fred had pulled away, but Fred instead leaned forward as fast and as hard as he could. The inside of Carney's forearm hit Fred's neck, the blade a good four inches past the intended target. The momentum brought them face to face, close enough to kiss. Fred's knife plunged into Carney's abdominal aorta, the second largest blood vessel in the body. Carney's eyes went wide. He knew. He could have used his last moments to try another slash, but Fred saw something in the soon-to-be-dead man's eyes. Respect. Carney had been beat, and he knew it. Carney let his knife fall free. It clattered on the thin deck. When Fred pulled his own blade free of the man's body, all of the blood in Carney's abdominal cavity rushed to flood the breach. Carney quickly jammed most of three fingers into the wound, his opponent forgotten. He dropped to his knees, his eyes floating and beginning to glaze over as all the color left his face. He was as good as Fred thought. Carney's quick thinking and quicker acting were the only reasons he was still alive. It wouldn't save him, however. 
it would only slow the process a few moments. I thought you'd flinch away, Carney said. I... I was sure of it. Fred crouched down low to speak in Carney's ear. He planned to make the most of the short time his opponent had left. Carney, tell me about the girl. Tell me about Janine. There's no reason not to. Carney didn't answer. He slumped to his side, blood covering his hand and already pooling on the rusty deck. Fred knelt with him, held the man's face. Carney, the girl! Tell me about the girl! Carney's eyes already had that distant cast to them, like they were looking into the next world. He focused on Fred for a moment, managed to smile. I was going to get her. I was going to get her for myself. Make a little extra. She's alive. Carney lost consciousness. He died a few seconds later. Fred let go of him. He cleaned the blood from his blade on Carney's shabby mine worker's clothes and sheathed it. He cast his gaze around the shanty town. No one rushed out. There hadn't been any noise. If anyone had seen the altercation from a distance, it would have looked like a fistfight that lasted less than three seconds. Fred walked over to where Carney had dropped his rucksack. He felt a stinging in his eyes, but refused to acknowledge the tears. Kneeling, he began to rummage through the bag. On top, he found a pair of IDs. Elder Rodrigo Goldblatt, Lady Mariella Goldblatt, both confirmed. Rodrigo's face? That was Carney, or whoever he had been. His name might have actually been Rodrigo, for all Fred knew. Lady Mariella's face, her prints, her DNA code? All blank. Below the IDs, blue robes of the confirmed. One male, one female. Below that, a few personal effects. A tattered old sweater, a holo cube, other things that had been the mementos of Carney's life. And below all of that, at the bottom of the rucksack, a uniform. It was the uniform of a mining Colony 6 detention center guard. Chapter 22 Janine the prisoner barracks were little more than a dungeon with barely functional plumbing. They didn't keep long-term prisoners on McCovey. Virtually everyone arrested in the colony was sent to the mines as an honor worker, which was another word for slave. Anyone too dangerous to put to work was shipped off to the maximum security facility on Mining Colony 1. The rest were just drunks and bar brawlers thrown in cells to cool down or sleep it off before they returned to their grind. Didn't think we were shipping this one out till morning, the morbidly obese block boss said to Fred as he escorted him past several cells. Fred, wearing Carney's stolen uniform and carrying a decades out of date message board with a mining colony six seal on the back, shrugged noncommittally. Yeah, well, there's a few open spots on the transport tonight, and I got tickets to check out the Raiders Spring Training Camp tomorrow. The fat man snorted derisively. <laughs> Raiders, they ain't been shit since they lost Barnes. Fred felt an insane rush of laughter at the irony of the guard's comment, but squashed the impulse and stayed in character. I've heard that, was all he said. The block boss, who was already out of breath, pointed five cells down. It's that, and let me give you the key. As Fred waited for him to dig it out, he asked, Why aren't they sending her back to the mines? Never heard of us having a labor surplus around here. The guard shook what must have been three chins. She keeps causing problems, rabble-rousing, trying to organize the workers, finally graduated to sabotage this last go-around. Between you and me, the boss has sold her into a batch of girls headed to Solomon next week, probably be in some holy man's whorehouse by month's end. Ain't she a little old for that? Holy men like them young. The many-chin guard nodded. Yeah, but when you see her, you'll understand why. Wish I could keep her for myself, but she'd sooner break my jaw than give it up. Holy men want her? <laughs> they can have her. He handed Fred the key and clapped him on the shoulder. Drop that by on your way out. I need to sit a spell. He waddled away. Fred walked up the block to the cell the guard had indicated. He peered through the bars. There was a slender woman curled up on a ratty bunk. Her head was a mess of dark hair. 
Fred couldn't see her face. He opened the cell door and stepped inside. Carbonaro, Janine, let's go! The girl didn't move. A rush of panic shattered his disaffected, raiders-loving prison guard persona. Had they gotten to her first? Did Greedock have another man in the mines? Was she sick, and if so, how bad was it? Fred walked to the bunk and reached down, grasping her shoulder gently. Janine moved with surprising speed. Her hand was cupped around a piece of stone chipped from the walls that she'd obviously sharpened against the ground. Its rough edge slid across his right cheekbone, slicing the skin there wide open. Damn it! Fred yelled, more out of frustration than pain. He kept his cool and disarmed her with a knife hand to her wrist. He twisted her arm behind her as gently as he could and held her still. Let me go! You can throw me back into the mine or you can kill me, but that's the last thing you'll take from me! She would have yelled more, but Fred clamped a hand over her mouth to silence her. Even then, she continued to struggle, filled with fire and righteous indignation. Fred had no doubt she was sincere in what she'd said, and he couldn't help respecting that. He turned her so they were face to face, keeping that dangerous arm of hers behind her back. Her eyes widened with fear. Fred felt like an idiot. Face to face, hidden away in a dingy cell where no one would hear, where no one would come to help, he was a man overpowering a woman. Later, they made it out of this together. He somehow knew she would laugh at her reaction when she found out the truth. But for now, one piece of information could make this go smoother. Your brother sent me. She stopped fighting. Fear still filled her eyes, as did disbelief, but there was an ember of curiosity. She would kill Fred if she could, but that could wait until she heard his story. Fred liked this woman already. He was finally able to take a good look at her face. There was no doubt. This was the flesh and blood of Quentin Barnes. They had the same eyes, the same mouth. On Quentin, those features looked impossibly handsome. On Janine, they took on an almost artistic quality. The guard had been right. No matter what her age, this was the kind of woman that many men wanted to own. Her full lips moved. My brothers are dead. Fred smiled. Oh, Cher, the stories that I have to tell you. Once they'd left the jail, it had been child's play to blend into McCovey's crowds. Janine was a native. She knew how to walk, how to talk. Add in a veil for her blue robes for them both, and a pair of fake IDs, all courtesy of the rucksack that had contained Carney's well-prepared plan, and they'd headed straight for the shuttle port. They hit orbit 90 minutes after Janine had cut his face open with a rough piece of concrete. In a first-class compartment on a key passenger liner, Elder Rodrigo Goldblatt stared dumbfounded at his wife. What do you mean you don't want to meet him? Janine crossed her arms. I didn't stutter. It means what it means. I don't want to meet my brother. Fred rubbed his eyes, tried to put the pieces together. After all he'd been through to find this woman, and now she didn't want to meet Quentin? That doesn't make any sense. She rolled her eyes. The big, strong man comes to rescue me, and now I'm supposed to do what he says, right? Right, Fred said. I mean, well, Quentin hired me to find you. And I found you. Now I take you to him. You meet your brother. Everyone wins. I have to be playing the game to win, she said. I don't know, Quentin. I haven't seen him since he was a baby. Maybe I need to learn a little bit about him before, before I open myself up to something. Fred saw the look on her face, and he knew what she really meant. She'd been hurt before. Many times. And maybe by family. He's a great guy, Fred said. Take my word for it. She smiled a humorless smile. Take the word of a man who lies for a living, who pretends to be other people for a living? The answer is no, Frederico. She insisted on using his full first name, refused to call him Fred. 
This is crazy. When we land on INF, I'll tell your brother about you, then you can go wherever the hell you want to go. She shook her head. No, you won't tell him about me. You don't have my permission to do that. Your permission? Lady, I get hired to do things. This time, I got hired to find you. I found you. Case closed. She tapped her chest with her forefinger. I'm a sentient being, Frederico. You don't get to just throw me around like a piece of meat. I've had enough of that for one life. Her voice broke a little on the last word. She was playing all hard, keeping her expression as blank as she could, but she wasn't as good as Quentin at that game. Fred had just rescued her from a prison, a prison where they hadn't treated her well, to say the least. Fred was born in the nation. So was Janine. He knew all too well how difficult life could be there. For a woman, it was even worse. Women had no right to vote, no right to own property, and most of the time, they were property. Maybe he could understand why she didn't want to be passed around like a trophy. So what then? You want to go back home? She let out a huff of disgust. Not in this lifetime. I never want to see McCovey again. I think I'll hang out with you for a while. What? Lady, don't flatter yourself. You're not your type. She smiled. A friendlier smile this time. I know I'm not. I'm guessing no girl is. Fred felt a stab of fear in his stomach. They were away from the purest nation, but being found out, in any capacity, still generated an instinctive burst of panic. How did you know? Janine pointed to her breasts. Because you haven't been finding excuses to look at these. He looked at them now, wanting to kick himself. Aside from the cuts and bruises on her face, she was gorgeous even with the thin lines brought on by a hard life. Any straight man would have drooled over her, and Fred had completely forgotten to play the part. He looked at her eyes. Maybe I'm not into boobs. She laughed. Yeah, right. Listen, Frederico, I don't really have any place else to go. I'm not saying I won't meet Quentin, just not yet. And he hired you to find me, so if you send me on my way and something happens to me, you didn't do your job. Can I just crash with you for a bit? He didn't know what to say. He couldn't force her to meet Quentin. He could tell Quentin about her and be done with it, but he wasn't going to hold her against her will while her brother came to see her, and it was easy to see that she'd try and bolt. She had that skittish look to her, the look of someone who had survived by running at the earliest sign of danger. If he cut her loose, Greedock was out there, looking for her. Greedock, and who knew who else? She tilted her head and grinned. Come on, how bad could it be? Bad, he said. Sometimes, sometimes I have nightmares. Her smile faded. Yeah. I think I know what kind. So do I. They stared at each other for a moment, and he knew that she understood. He hadn't even told her what the nightmares were about. He hadn't told anyone what they were about, not that he had anyone to tell, but she got it. She knew loss. She knew pain. He sighed. How long? Janine shrugged. I don't know. Don't you get to keep billing my brother for this? Fred couldn't stop a small laugh. Actually, yeah, I do. Her smile returned, more mischievous than ever. Well then, Frederico, I think you can buy a girl a nice dinner or two. Book 6. Ionath Chapter 23. Garrison I thought Donald Pine was the answer to our problems, but now I know better, said the quith worker grab cab driver. From the first time I saw Elder Barnes throw a pass, I knew I was watching a future Hall of Fame quarterback. Uh-huh, Fred said. He said it to be polite. Why he was polite to chatty cab drivers, he had no idea, but it was an automatic reaction. He should have known it was coming. 
Fred had taken note of the Kraken's pendant, flying proudly from the cab's flashing multilingual on-duty sign when it picked him and Janine up at the shuttle port. Janine sat quietly. If she had any thoughts on the cab driver's devotion to her brother, she didn't make any sign. Pine is a legend, the worker said. I do not deny it, but Elder Barnes, there is magic in his arm, and I don't even believe in the supernatural. Fred felt like he'd been traveling for months. From McCovey, on the outskirts of the Purest Nation, to New Wittock in the Wittock Kingdom, to Capizzi in the Planetary Union, then into the Quith Concordia, for a changeover at Free Station, then to OS-1, and finally to Ionath. He could scarcely remember which identity he'd used to cross which border. He was exhausted. He was also still recovering from the beating. Correction, beatings, plural. He'd been choked and punched in the records room, banged around a sandrail while dodging artillery explosions, then slapped around a bit in Stedmar's office. Fred had never been more aware he wasn't an 18-year-old raw recruit anymore. For that reason, and a few others, it was good to be heading home. He had several homes, each one belonging to a separate identity. This time, he was Garrison Woolworth, and Garrison's place was one of Fred's favorites. He liked living on Ionath, far from the reach of the Pyrrhus Nation, and just outside the crush of the Kretorakian Empire's megalomaniacal thumb. Fred had swallowed a bellyful of oppression and never wanted to feel it burning through him again. The Quith valued interspecies commerce, and Fred respected their culture. Honor was a real thing to a Quith warrior, as integral to their existence as oxygen or sustenance. It wasn't just a pretense to which they paid lip service, like religion so often became in the purest nation. Of course, the Quith claimed their own brands of corruption and hypocrisy, but perfection thus far had escaped all cultures. Ionath City's Human District a six-block span teeming with homo sapien life of every color and configuration. Literally piled on top of each other, the humans of Ionath had no choice but to get along. That didn't mean you couldn't find violence and racism around every corner, but a balance had to be maintained for everyone to live and work and play. Garrison's apartment was above a watering hole called T.O. Burt's. The proprietor, Roberto Parca, was the sole bartender and also the landlord. Bert's epic beard reached below his sternum. He loved history, beer, literature, and the Ionath Krakens. Many was the night between cases that Fred Slash Garrison spent hunched over the bar top, talking books and famous military battles with the man, both of them tipping a little too much. There wasn't much room in T.O. Bert's, nor was there much in the way of decoration, and a daily cleaning wasn't exactly at the top of Roberto's to-do list. These were just some of the reasons Fred loved the bar. If tourists knew about the place, they didn't come. Strangers wandered in from time to time, but for the most part, Fred knew the faces of the regulars, regulars who knew how to keep to themselves. There was an antique pool table. Roberto stocked top-shelf spirits and the best selection of cigars in the Quith Concordia. He also kept a quad-barreled pulse rifle behind the bar and watched over his tenants' quarters when they were away. Fred had always felt that live eyes connected to a suspicious, easily offended, and well-armed friend was better than any high-tech security system. The grab cab followed the radius road's curve, just another vehicle in the city's endless circular traffic, before finally depositing Fred in front of his destination. He and Janine stepped out. Fred pointed up a set of metal stairs, then handed her a metal key. She took it, looked at it like the artifact it was. No bio lock? He shook his head. Not unless you want Greedox goons to detect your DNA, thumbprint, or both, and come running. No, thanks, she said. Metal keys work just fine. See you upstairs. She headed up the steps. She had no bag. She'd left with nothing and had nothing to carry. He would have to take her shopping soon, get her some clothes. Fred decided to stop by the bar briefly before heading upstairs. He knew he'd probably find Bert using the bar's big holotank to call up text to illustrate a point to one of his regulars. As it happened, when Fred walked in, a red-faced Bert had one finger on the tank, tracing a line of text and shouting in the face of a half-in-the-bag human customer. I told you, idiot, Bert said. 
It was 2285, and it was the gates of Absalom. The patron, a big-nosed, white-skinned tower native, Fred knew to play a mean trumpet, only nodded and asked for another drink. Fred walked up to the bar. Did I miss the entire lesson, Professor? Bert looked up. His thick tangle of face fur split into a wide smile. Garrison! He finished pouring the man's drink, then strode around the bar to embrace Fred. Welcome home, Mio, Bert said, clapping Fred's back several times, loudly, causing considerable pain that Fred didn't let the older man see. How are things, Tio? Bert waved a hand dismissively. The same. I don't change. Neither does my place. Fred nodded. I count on that. You look like you need a drink. I need a shower more, Fred said. I'll take a rain check, though. Listen, I wanted to tell you I've got company in my apartment. Bert smiled a smile that was more of a dirty sneer. Really? What's her name? Fred was happy his hetero posturing could fool at least someone. Angelique. And her husband is looking for her. I'll have to leave her up there from time to time. You'll keep an eye out? Let me know if anyone comes sniffing around? Bert winked. You know it, my friend. Your piece of tail is safe as long as she is under my roof. Thanks, Fred said. He shook the man's hand and headed upstairs. Piece of tail. If Fred wanted one of those, it wouldn't look like Janine Carbonaro. He climbed the stairs, taking a moment to look out on the circular streets of Ionath City. His trained eyes sought out anyone watching him, following him, but he saw nothing. He had done it. Now all he had to do was keep this woman safe until she decided to meet her brother. Fred walked into his apartment, locking the doors multiple locks behind him. Chapter 24 Garrison's Apartment Janine was looking around, a frown on her face. I thought you guys were supposed to be crazy about interior decoration, she said. Stereotype much? He dropped his bags just inside the threshold of the living room. Like all of Fred's apartments, Garrison's place looked Spartan. Fred didn't believe in clutter. He wasn't decorative by nature. He also wasn't a fan of too many mementos or personal knickknacks. There were a few pieces of comfortable modular furniture, a small gym set up in the corner, and a medium-sized holo tank. He kept an office in the spare room, through a tall, open arch at the end of the apartment's single hallway. Fred went there first, moving past the few pictures he'd bothered to hang. The pictures all showed a man with a mustache, more jawbone, and different color eyes. Anyone breaking in here would be hard-pressed to see Fred through the images of Garrison. Inside the office, Fred shook loose the shoulder rig that held his blades and hung it on a hook next to the archway. The desk was relatively clean as well. There were a few message boards stacked haphazardly to one side. A large display loomed over the desktop. Janine followed him in. Is this your main office? I have a place downtown. I spend most of my time there. How come? It's safer. Armored walls, a hidden door, that kind of thing. Her eyebrows raised. I see you make a lot of friends in this line of work. I'm a people person. You should show me. I'd love to see the office of a dangerous private detective. I'll tell you what. I'll show you my office if you meet your brother. She glared at him. I'll let you know when I want to meet him. And you'll show me your office soon enough. Why would I do that? I'm convincing, she said. You learn how to be patient in prison. If I ask enough, you'll take me. She was so confident in herself, so assured. My office is off limits, he said. You can stay here until you figure out what you want to do. She laughed, waved a hand dismissively. We'll see. Speaking of, Quentin, isn't there a foosball season coming up or something? He stared. Foos? Ball? Are you screwing with me? She blinked, then smiled and snapped her fingers. Oh, sorry. Football. Your brother is one of the most famous athletes in the galaxy, and you don't even know what sport he plays? She shrugged. My brother's name is Quentin Carbonaro. 
Until you came to get me, I'd never heard of Quentin Barnes. I've been in prison three years, Frederico. Prison and in other places. Her confident aura faded. Fred felt the need to talk, to fill the uncomfortable silence. You, uh, you really don't know anything about football? She shook her head. I'm afraid they didn't beam in holocast to my cell. Maybe you can teach me. Fred shrugged. It's fun to watch, but I don't know all that much about it. We can learn together. It'll be a little bonding experience. Is there a game this week? Season doesn't even start for a couple of months. I know that the opening game is here in Ionath, though, uh, against the, uh, the Isis Ice Storm. She clapped, a very girly gesture from a woman so hardened by life. Can we go to it? We can study up on the sport together before then. We'll be experts. He thought of Ionath Stadium, of over a hundred thousand sentients packed in tight. He thought of the cameras, the guards, the cops. Most of all, he thought of how the security personnel worked for Greedock. Fred shook his head. Not a good idea. Disguises are good in moderation, but INS Stadium has more biometric recognition hardware than any other place in the city. The stuff they used to scan for terrorists could turn up a hit on me or on you. He pointed to the holo tank. If you're still around by opening week, we can watch it here. It's a date, Janine said. But I'm exhausted. Where's the bed? Fred pointed to the couch. That sleeps just fine. It's a one-bedroom apartment, so... Janine walked to the living room's one closed door. Thanks, she said. I appreciate you taking the couch, Frederico. She opened the door to the bedroom, entered, and shut the door behind her. Fred sighed. There were many reasons he lived alone. This was one of them. He was also exhausted. He lay down on the couch and was asleep in minutes. Book 7, the 2684 season, week 6. Chapter 25, the OS-1 orbiting death. She wore a Kraken's ball cap. He'd bought it for her back in week one of the regular season. She'd grabbed it and thrown it to the ground so many times in the past six weeks that the fabric had already started to fray. Maybe she picked up the habit from watching Hokor the Hook Chess constant sideline tantrums. Come on, Krakens, she screamed at the holo tank. OS-1 sucks! Get a touchdown! He'd spent nearly six months with this woman. Their shared history of loss provided a common ground, an unspoken bond. She'd consistently avoided meeting Quentin. At first, her self-invitation to move in had driven Fred crazy. After only a few weeks, however, he'd gladly accepted the fact that she was the best roommate he'd ever had. Is your brother playing well? Janine nodded. She'd become a student of the game, learning more in one half of a season than Fred had in several years. He still had little interest in the sport outside of its web of criminal connections and the high-income players that wanted to hire him. He's having a great season, she said. The way he leads the team, I've just never seen anything like it. Not that I've ever watched much football, mind you. She looked at Fred and she smiled. From a distance, he seems okay. I think it might be time. Fred forced a smile. That's great. When you're ready, I'll set it up. He felt a pang of regret. If he had booted her to the curb when they'd reached Ionath, like he should have, it probably would have been different. But having her here, under his roof, spending all this time with her day after day... He hadn't spent that much time with anyone, not since Raphael had been murdered. Having someone around, someone who cared, it had been nice. But now she was ready to meet Quentin. She would leave, but that was fine. He'd spent most of his life alone, and he knew he'd slide back into old routines almost immediately. Old, lonely routines. Janine jumped up from the couch, clapping, Come on, Rekka! Go, go, go! The camera followed an orange-jerseyed Rebecca Montaigne as she crossed the goal line. Touchdown, Ionet! Came the voice from the holo tank. A 12-yard pass 
from Quentin Barnes to Rebecca Monte. What do you think of that play, Chick? A play-action boot fooled most of the defense, Masara, said the co-commentator. Maybe that was a play-by-play guy. Fred didn't really know the difference. A much-needed score by the Krakens, but Barnes took quite a shot from Yala the Biter at the end. Janine jumped and clapped. My baby brother throws for another six. The tank showed players gathering in the end zone. Then the image cut back to Quentin. He was facing a Quith Warrior player dressed in the flat black uniforms of the OS1 team. Quentin looked rumpled, like he just stood up from a tackle. Blood poured down from a large gash on his chin. Fred saw the look in Quentin's eyes. Oh no, not now, Q. Not now. The warrior turned and walked away. Quentin took off his helmet, stepped forward, then whipped the helmet down on the back of the warrior's head. The warrior dropped face first onto the black turf. Hi, one, Janine said. She sat heavily on the couch. In the tank, a snarling, wide-eyed, blood-smeared Quentin raised the helmet high to bring it down on the prone warrior. A hurrah flew in, and Quentin's helmet instead hit the black and white striped ref. Whistles blew. More refs swarmed in. Turn it off, Janine said. Now. Fred did so. The room fell quiet. They sat there, together, saying nothing, but the look on her face spoke volumes. She looked crushed. He reached out and took her hand, not knowing what he was doing before he did it. He's not like that all the time. He's like that some of the time, she said. And some of the time is too much. She turned to face Fred. I'm not ready yet. He's too violent. I'm really sorry, Frederico, but do you mind if I wait a little longer? Fred nodded and was happy he managed to hide his smile. Whatever you need. I'm in no hurry. Billable hours, right? She sniffed. Then she reached out and threw her arms around him, held him tight. Her body shook a little. Fred felt tears on his neck. Janine had allowed herself to hope, and now that hope was gone. Fred held her, patted her back. It's okay. I'm here. He was there for her. It was his job to protect her, sure, but that wasn't the only thing. He was able to be there to support another sentient, to help someone through a hard time. He hadn't done that for so long, and it felt good. Chapter 26. Someone to Talk to Fred woke up screaming. He jumped off the couch and landed in a fighting stance, his sweat dripping down to the floor below. He looked to the corners, searching the shadows, looking for the men who burned Raphael, waiting for the axe handle to hit again and again and again. He found his blades in his hands, remembered he'd set his shoulder rig on the back of the couch in case someone broke in. He turned, looking for a target, an outlet for the rage that would not let him go. And then the room lights came on. The shadows vanished. In the bedroom door stood Janine Carbonaro, sleepy-eyed, her pajamas rumpled. Frederico, she said, it's okay. He stared at her, his brain trying to extricate itself from the dream where everyone he saw wanted to hurt him, where everyone he saw was an enemy. The loa crawled up from behind her back, perched on her shoulder. This is different, is it not, Cher? Are you going to put a knife in her belly for her troubles? Fred blinked, unsure if he was awake or still asleep. The loa was there on Janine's shoulder, but Janine wasn't part of his dreams. She took a hesitant step forward. He saw fear in her eyes. No one is here, she said. It's just you and me. The door is locked. No one is here, Frederico. She took another small step toward him. The loa on her shoulder pointed at the blades. You going to cut her, Rico? 
Are you going to make her pay for a murder she didn't commit? A murder that's so old you can't always remember exactly how it went down? Janine's wide eyes locked on Fred's. She took two more steps toward him, closing the distance. Her trembling hands reached up, palms out. Give me the knives, Frederico. Sit down. Talk to me. In his head, Fred heard Raphael's screams. But Raph was gone. He turned the knife's handle first and set them in her hands. Moving carefully, she returned them to their sheaths. Then her trembling hands reached out and held his. Sit, she said. They both sat on the couch. A nightmare, she said. Something from your past? You want to talk about it? Fred closed his eyes. He shook his head. No, I've never talked about it, to anyone. Janine reached up and smoothed his sweaty hair. The gesture was so tender, so comforting. I'm not just anyone, she said. I'm your friend, Frederico. If you've never talked about it, then maybe it's time to do that. Fred looked at her face, at her caring eyes. She wanted to help. No one wanted to help him, ever. Everyone just wanted him to do things for them. They wanted his disguises, his skills, and, sometimes, they wanted Rico to come out and play. But not Janine. She didn't want any of that. Talk to me, she said. I'm here. Fred sniffed. He wanted to chase her out, so he didn't have to deal with any of this. But there was something about her, something that made him trust her. His name was Raphael. On her shoulder, the Loa smiled. It tipped its top hat, bowed, and then it vanished. Fred cleared his throat. <clears> throat> I, I called him Raph. I loved him so much. And that was as far as Fred got before the tears came. They came and they stayed. Years of pain and anguish, of loss and rage and frustration, they all came pouring out. Beautiful, talented Raphael, burned at the stake like an animal, for nothing more than being in love. Fred didn't know how long he cried, didn't know how long Jeanine held him in her arms. When he finished crying, he started talking, and he couldn't stop. All of it came out, finally, and for the rest of the night and into the morning, Janine sat there and listened. Chapter 27 Killian Nice door, Janine said. You get that off a bank vault? Like I told you, Fred said. I'm a people person. She laughed and walked into his office. He shut the door behind them. For the last two weeks, she'd gone on and on about seeing his office. He'd thought he could keep things private from her, but he'd been wrong. She'd worn him down. And after the night he'd cried in her arms, he didn't feel like denying her anything anyway. To finally talk about Raph, to share that with another sentient being, it was an amazing feeling. Fred would never get over the horror of Raph's murder, but to finally talk about all that heartbreaking history, Fred had to admit he felt better than he had in years. Janine walked to his white desk. Nice, all color-coordinated and everything. She reached down and started opening drawers. Fred walked quickly toward the desk. Don't, he said, but it was too late. She held up a suit coat made out of a shiny pink material. She looked at it, then looked at him, and raised her eyebrows. Really, Fred? Isn't this a bit... much? He actually felt embarrassed. I had it made to prove a point. What point? That you can be a ridiculous stereotype? Now he felt more embarrassed. How ironic. He'd worn that very coat to make Quentin Barnes feel uncomfortable, and now he felt uncomfortable when Quentin's sister was making a big deal of it. Just put it back, he said. It's none of your business. 
She rolled her eyes. No, no, don't get me wrong. I think it's just lovely. She slid the coat on. It fit her. Maybe she was dainty by the standards of the Barnes Carbonaro family, but she was big for a woman, almost as tall as Fred was. She pranced out from behind the desk, spinning and playing the fashion model. I look marvelous, she said. Oh, Fred, you are such a stylist. Just who were you proving a point to with this? He started to talk, then laughed. It took him a moment to recover. It was, it was for the first time I met your brother. She stopped prancing. Her eyes widened and a smile pulled up the corners of her mouth. My brother? My big macho purist nation brother? She started giggling. She put her hand to her mouth, a ridiculously feminine gesture for someone as tough as her. Oh, my high one, she said. What did you do? Pretend to be all super gay or something? Fred shrugged. She threw her head back and laughed. Oh, oh, every atom of his nationalite soul must have been trying to run for the door. Wait, wait, did he run for the door? He wanted to, Fred said. But to his credit, he didn't. He was very uncomfortable, but he accepted me. She stopped laughing. He did? I was as surprised as you are now. I put on a really poofy show figuring he'd take off and I wouldn't have to take his case. She turned her head a little, squinted at him. So he stayed, so what? If you didn't want to take his case, why did you? Fred shrugged. There's something about him, Janine. He didn't like me because I was gay, but he kind of realized he didn't actually know any gay people, and he gave it a shot. He was just so, so open about it. Huh. That's hard to believe. But if you say he did it, I believe you. You should, Fred said. That's the reason you're not in that cell. He's the reason. Fred's index finger vibrated. He lifted his hand, held it palm up, let the display appear a few inches above his skin. It read, Incoming call request from Quentin Barnes. Speak of the devil, Fred said. It's your brother. She instantly started shaking her head. You promised. Relax. He doesn't know about you. He's just calling me. Fred walked behind his desk. Janine took a few small steps back. What are you doing? I'm going to answer my client's call. But you promised. Fred sat in his desk chair. I promised not to tell him about you until you were ready. I didn't promise to ignore my business. Just stay to the right side of the desk and he won't see you, okay? She stared at him, then looked down. She moved to the right side of the desk. She nodded. Fred made a tossing motion, as if to throw the palm-up display onto the desk. The white desktop flashed, then an image of Quentin Barnes appeared. He was sitting next to a man in his late forties, a man with the weathered face of the working class who was eating a sandwich. He looked small sitting next to Quentin, but only because Quentin was a seven-foot-tall, 400-pound walking tank. Obviously, the unknown man would tower over Fred. Quentin, Fred said. What's up? I don't have a status update for you or I would have sent word. I'm just getting ready to travel again. I've got a lead on your sister. I'm afraid I don't have any information on your father, though. That's okay, Quentin said. You can stop looking for him. For once, Quentin Barnes didn't look all intense and moody. He looked happy. Hell, aside from the giant's body and the huge muscles, he looked like a delighted little kid. Fred looked at the man sitting next to Quentin and felt a sinking feeling. Come again? I found him, Quentin said. I found my father. The man raised the sandwich in greeting. That sinking feeling sank even further. Quentin, who is that? My dad, Killian Carbonaro. It was all Fred could do to not look to his right, to Janine, but he saw her out of the corner of his eye. She was slowly shaking her head. He focused on the conversation at hand. And you found him? Yes. Well, no, Greedock did. He called in a bunch of favors. Somehow, Greedock tracked him down. 
Janine stepped a little in front of the desk, so Fred could see her without looking away from the holo display. With exaggerated features, she mouthed the words, Not Our Father. In an instant, Fred understood what had happened. Greedock, Gooley, Bobby Brobst. Gooley had grabbed the information on Quentin's family and delivered it to Greedock. Greedock had used that to create a fake father, one that Quentin clearly believed was real. But for what purpose? Fred looked at the chewing man. Quentin, you're telling me that this is your father? Uh huh. That's Killian Carbonaro? In the flesh, Quentin said. The man finally swallowed down his mouthful of sandwich. Pleased to meet you, Mr. Gonzaga. Quentin is quite fond of you. He's fond of the detective who let this happen? We'll see how long that lasts when the truth comes out. How nice, Fred said. I don't mean fond, fond, Killian said. I know you're, uh, gay. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Quentin's smile faded. Dad, you should stop talking now. The man laughed uncomfortably, then took another oversized bite of his sandwich. Fred could not believe Greedock's audacity. The crime lord would stop at nothing. Quentin had hired Fred to find the truth, and Greedock had hijacked that truth to tell a crushing lie. Greedock had the upper hand, and that was Fred's fault. And in the end, Quentin would be the one to get hurt. Quentin, Fred said, I don't know what to say. Say you're happy for me. He had to make Quentin see the obvious. But if he came out and told Quentin the man was a fake, Quentin would want to know how Fred knew that. And Fred couldn't say, Because your sister I'm keeping from you just told me so. Fred stared at Janine. She shook her head. Even now, she didn't want to be known to Quentin. Fred focused on his client. No, that's not what I mean. I told you sentients were following me when I was on McCovey searching for information. I think those sentients may have worked for Greedock. So? Fred again looked at the man sitting next to Quentin. The man didn't show a shred of suspicion or concern. Whoever he was, he was damn good. A better actor than Fred by far. Fred had to make Quentin doubt the man with his father, but Quentin didn't want to doubt. So, Fred said, Greedock's goons took all my information. Well, what difference does it make, Fred? So they took your information. You got paid for your time, and if that information helped them find my dad, then everyone wins, right? At that moment, Fred wanted to shoot Greedock right in his little black furred face. Fred couldn't do a damn thing. If Janine wouldn't reveal herself to Quentin, Quentin wouldn't be the wiser. Fred nodded. Yeah, I guess so. Are you pissed that Greedock got the job done? Something like that, Fred said. You, uh, you run a genetics test? Quentin nodded. We did. This is my dad, Fred. Mission accomplished. I just wanted to let you know. Fred did not like to lose, but at the moment there was no question that he had. So, I should stop looking for him, then? Quentin laughed. <laughs> yeah. Keep looking for my sister, though, okay? Same rates? Fred fought the urge to look up at Janine again. Sure, he said. Happy to keep at it. Great. Quentin smiled, that mesmerizing, genuine smile he had in the rare moments when he let his guard down. Fred, I know you didn't find him and all that, but now he's here. If your information did lead to Greedock finding my dad, then I can't thank you enough. Can you come up and meet him? Some of the team's coming over tonight to hang out. Fred forced a smile. Thanks for the offer, but I fly out in an hour. Looking for my sister? Fred nodded. Where are you going? I'd rather not say. Seems my activities and accomplishments are of far too much interest to unknown parties. I'll let you know when I get back. Fred broke the connection. He looked up at Janine. Thanks for the assist, he said. 
I really appreciate it. She started to say something, then stopped. She looked down. What was I supposed to do? Help him, Fred said. So you don't know Quentin. So what? He's your flesh and blood. He's being used, manipulated. How can you not want to help? She thought on his words. He saw the look in her eyes slowly change, from one of doubt, fear, and regret, to one of anger, one that promised someone was going to pay. The same look that Fred had seen many times in Quentin's eyes. The resemblance was spooky. Not just the shape and the color of the eyes, but the emotions they revealed. You're right, she said. He's my baby brother. I won't let anyone mess with his head like that. So can I call him back? Janine shook her head. No, I want to do it in person. But we can just call him. We can... In person, she said. I haven't done the right thing. A carbonaro handles things face to face. If we call Quentin now and he's on a ship with this imposter, what do you think my brother would do? Fred hadn't thought of that. Quentin Barnes, a world-class athlete, seven feet tall, nearly 400 pounds, and with serious rage control issues? He might kill him, Fred said. She nodded. Exactly. So I need to be there. It's kind of a test, I guess, to see if Quentin can control his temper. Just because you're there doesn't mean he won't flip out. I know, but maybe if I'm there I can help. She wasn't ready to start a relationship with her brother, but at the same time, she didn't want to just dump this information on him and leave him hanging. Okay, Fred said. We can make that happen. The Krakens are on a bye week. I'll get us a shuttle. We'll see if we can catch him on the Hypatia. There's more, Janine said. Who is the one who set this up? Greedock the Splithead. Then he needs to be there, too. Fred put his hands on the desktop, feeling the smooth, cool surface beneath his skin. Five minutes ago, you weren't ready to show your face to your brother. Now you want to not only reveal to him he has a fake father, but you want to be in the same room with the murdering gangster who made it happen? She stared. Then, slowly, she nodded. That's right. And that's the only way I'm going to do it. Uh, Greedock isn't all that fond of me, Janine. I've had run-ins with him before. What kind of run-ins? The kind that mean he'd like to see me dead. She walked to the desk. She leaned on it, her hair hanging down. That look in her eyes, that Quentin look, hadn't changed. My brother hired you to do a job. You want to complete that job? You do it my way. Besides. Are you afraid of Greedock? No, Fred said. I'm terrified of him. She smiled. Sure, but I can tell by the expression on your face that you probably wouldn't mind making him look bad. Fred smiled. Did she know him that well already, or did she just have the same knack as her brother, that ability to see a person's true nature? Either way, she was right. Greedock had won this game— unless Fred was the one who revealed it all to Quentin. Okay, Fred held up a finger. But first, I have to find out when they'll all be together. That could take a little time. And second, when we do this, you do what I say when I say it. I'm the general, you're the foot soldier. She stood and crossed her arms. I can take care of myself. Normally, I'm sure you can, but Greedock isn't normal. Neither are the people that work for him. That's the deal, Janine. You give me your word that you'll do what I say, when I say it, and you won't question me. Her eyes narrowed. Clearly, this woman didn't like anyone telling her what to do. Finally, she nodded and held out her hand. Done, she said. You have a deal. Fred looked at her offered hand, realizing that he'd been in the same spot when he'd shaken Quentin's. Like sister, like brother. He shook. All right, he said. Let's get started.
Chapter 28 Torba the Hungries Fred shouldered a platter of food so big he had to tilt his head to the right to carry it. His fake beard itched, but that didn't bother him. It was showtime. The kitchen of Torba the Hungries bustled with activity. Bustled with intensity was a better way to describe it. There were only five guests in a restaurant that normally seated over a hundred, but they were very, very important guests. Two weeks had passed since the call from Quentin. Fred had put that time to work, tracking down Greedock's intentions, landing he and Janine temporary jobs at the restaurant. They'd spent a week working here, preparing for this moment. He leaned close to Janine, who was struggling to balance her own heaping platter of overstuffed plates. Like him, she wore a white waiter's coat. You ready? She looked at him with wide eyes. No, but let's do it anyway. You sure? It's not too late to bail out. A quith leader in a red velvet coat scurried up to them. You have food, Torba said. Do not just stand there. Bring it to the guests. If that John Tweedy ate any more, I'd swear he's a heavy G. The leader turned to face the kitchen staff. More food! I do not care what you make, just make it fast! Torba the Hungry then held the kitchen door open for Fred and Janine. Her eyes narrowed. She nodded, a gesture nearly imperceptible due to the tray that tilted her head to the side. Then she stepped out of the kitchen and into the restaurant proper. Fred followed her. The restaurant catered to Ionath's rich and famous. Real wood tables and fixtures. Crystal chandeliers that softly blazed with embedded multicolored plasma. Tasteful tablecloths and dozens of other delicate touches made this the place to be. But that night, only a single, round table showed any activity. At that table sat the black-furred quith leader responsible for all of this. Greedock, the splithead. Fred fought down the stab of fear at being so close to the gangster. There was a job to be done, and he would see it through. Quentin's fake father sat on Greedock's left, then Quentin, then the thick form of Jew Tweedy, then Jew's brother John. All four humans wore suits. Greedock wore so much jewelry, Fred wondered if he could walk on his own without assistance. And around the room stood six sentients, Greedock's bodyguards. The big, solid quith warriors Virak the Mean and Shoto the Bright, who doubled as linebackers for the Krakens. A key Fred had never seen before. A heavy key that had to weigh close to a thousand pounds. A fully robed Sklorno female and, damn it, Bobby Brobst. They were there to celebrate Ionath's win over the Wabash Wolfpack, something Greedock's team hadn't been able to do for 15 years. Greedock had rented the entire restaurant so as not to be bothered. Quentin raised a glass. He looks so happy. I almost hate to do this to him, but he needs to know the truth. This is just the beginning, Quentin said. Beating the wolf pack showed the galaxy that we are for real. We have a great squad, and we owe that to our owner. He looked at Greedock. Sir, you have done whatever it took to field the championship caliber team. For that, I say I'm happy to be a part of it. And personally, you have done more for me than I can say. I look forward to a decade of greatness. Quentin lifted his glass higher, then drank. The others at the table followed suit. Fred set his tray on a stand near the table, freeing his hands. Janine did the same. It was almost game time. The phony Killian Carbonaro set his glass down and leaned back. Wow, Greedock, thank you for this. A trivial gesture, the leader said. Your offspring's performance was of such a high caliber, I only wish I had more of his family with which to celebrate. Here we go. Janine seemed to sense the moment. She quickly walked over to stand next to Fred. Fred faced the table. I've got you covered on that one, Greedock. All heads turned to look at him. There was no recognition in their eyes, save for Greedock. Fred felt a chill wash through him as the single softball-sized eye narrowed. Gonzaga, the leader said. 
Quentin's eyes widened, and his jaw dropped as he saw through the disguise. On the other side of the room, Bobby Brope smiled an evil smile. His hand slid inside his jacket. The other guards also slowly reached for their weapons. Fred again looked at the bejeweled leader. You recognize me, Greedock? You've got a good eye. It's the smell, actually, Greedock said. Pungent and offensive, as always. I would have bathed for the occasion, but I was in a bit of a hurry. Perhaps because you were late from visiting your psychiatrist, Greedock said. For only mental deficiency could explain why you would dare to show your face in front of me anywhere, let alone at a private function to which you were not invited. Fred waited a brief moment, waited to see if Janine would turn and quietly walk away. She could still get out of this, and no one would be the wiser. But Janine Carbonaro stood firm. Fred smiled. But, Greedock, you invited family. He looked at Quentin, then at Killian. See? Isn't that the father that you found for Quentin? Killian fidgeted, looked around nervously. Dad, it's okay, Quentin said. Fred won't hurt us. He's just got some business with Greedock. Let them work it out. Wrong, Fred said. This business involves all of us, Killian included. Greedock's eyes swirled with curls of black. His fur fluffed slightly, then lay flat. In his head, Fred reviewed the restaurant's various exits. It was anyone's guess if he'd make it out of here alive. Gonzaga. The leader spoke in a quiet voice, a voice that dripped with death. Everyone at the table picked up on the hostile but calm vibe. They all sat very still. You may turn around right now and leave with your life, Greedock said. Say one more word to me or to anyone in my organization ever, and that life is forfeited. This was it, the point of no return. Fred swallowed, then worked his jaw side to side, trying to loosen the tension he felt all over his body. Greedock was giving him a way out. If he didn't take it, sooner or later the gangster would make Fred pay. Quentin turned toward Janine. The quarterback's eyes narrowed. Was that a look of recognition? John and Jew sat quietly. They didn't know what was going on, but the fake father did. Killian Carbonaro squirmed in his seat. It's too late to stop now. Are you going to finish the job or not? Yes, he would. Fred looked Greedock in the eye, then slowly shook his head. Fred, Quentin said, look, why don't you just go, okay? Whatever it is, I'll try and help. Barnes, Greedock said, stay out of this. Fred looked at his client. The kid was on top of the world with that huge contract and millions of adoring fans, but despite all of that, he'd been dealt a crap life. All the man really wanted was family. Fred would not fail him. Quentin, he said, then gestured to Janine. I want you to meet your sister. All of Quentin's confidence evaporated. He stared, shocked, stunned into silence. The room seemed as still as a frozen winter. Then, finally, he spoke in a voice far too small for his oversized body. Janine? Her ever-present hard expression softened. She nodded. Yes, Quentin, she said. I am your sister. She pointed at the fake Killian Carbonaro. And that man is not our father. The frozen room thawed, giving way to a steadily increasing heat, all generated from Quentin's shifting expression. That lost little boy look when Janine gave him the news, then the dawning of realization, and finally, a mask of rage. Fred silently reached out his left hand and held Janine's right. Quentin didn't see it. If he did, he didn't care, because his head turned and his hate-filled face fixed on Greedock. 
Janine took a half step back. Such a small gesture, but enough for Fred to know that Quentin had failed her test. There was a brief moment of possibilities, a chance that Quentin might settle this with words. Then that moment vanished as his tree trunk sized arms reached past the fake Killian toward Greedock, grabbed the edge of the table, and ripped it backward, sent it sailing through the air. Fred turned fast, his arm around Janine's shoulders, guiding her back to the kitchen before the table even landed. Behind them, a crescendo of violent noise filled the mostly empty restaurant. He kicked out, knocking the kitchen door open. He guided Janine through, expecting her to resist, thinking she might want to go back and help her brother, but she needed no urging. Get me out of here, she said. Get me away from him. They ran through the kitchen to a back door, then into a trash-strewn alley. Fred had planned several escape routes. This was the primary, and from the sound of things, everyone was too busy to follow them. Janine didn't ask questions. As promised, she did what Fred told her to do, went where he told her to go. In minutes, they had shed the waiter coats and were in a grab cab heading away from Torba the Hungries. In the back seat, Janine leaned against the door. Her hard expression had found its rightful place, chasing away what little softness had existed when she'd met her brother face to face. I'm sorry, Fred said. She didn't look at him. She simply shrugged. I'm not surprised. Quentin looks just like Dad. I guess he acts like him, too. Fred didn't know what Janine had gone through as a child, but from the aura of animosity radiating off of her, it hadn't been a life filled with lollipops and circus clowns. She finally turned to look at him. I think you did a good job, Frederico. It's not your fault. I'm not going back to McCovey, but I guess I'll figure something out. Oh, I'm not letting you out of my sight, he said. Greedock spent a lot of money trying to find you. He'll keep looking. If word gets out about you, so will Anna Volani, maybe even Gloria Ogawa. You're not safe on your own. She stared at him. She licked her lips, a bit of fear cracking the edges of her practiced, hard-as-nails expression. I can't pay you, she said. I don't have any money. Fred smiled his best comforting smile. Your brother has plenty. I know him. He'll pay to keep you safe. She raised an eyebrow. And if he doesn't? Fred turned away from her. He looked out the window at the constant, subtle curve of the circular road. He reached out his left hand, offering it. He felt her warm fingers lock in his. Janine Carbonaro would never be a lover. Fred had known true love, and he knew he wouldn't feel it again, but that wasn't what he had with her. He hadn't let her in, but she'd gotten in all the same. I'm here for you until you send me away, he said. As long as I'm alive, no one will hurt you, Janine. Never again. He felt her other hand rest lightly on the back of his, felt it circle. She pulled his hand to her chest, held it tight. Thank you, Frederico, she said. Thank you for everything. He didn't look at her. He knew that if he did, the sting in his eyes would turn into tears, and tears were a thing he'd given up back in the purest nation, shortly after a bonfire had taken from him the only thing he'd ever really wanted. For the first time since Raphael had died, Fred had a friend. A true friend. If anyone did try to hurt her, well, there was a wonderful man named Rico who would just love to make their acquaintance. This concludes the reading of The Detective, written by Scott Sigler and Matt Wallace, and performed by Scott Sigler. Copyright 2015 by Empty Set Entertainment. It was recorded at Empty Set Studios in San Diego, California. Produced by A. Kovacs and engineered by Steve Rickyberg. This has been a presentation of Empty Set Entertainment.
If you would like to learn more about Scott Sigler and listen to his free weekly serialized audiobooks, please visit scottsigler.com. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.